Shalom, and welcome to another edition of The Pursuit of Wisdom. My name is Warner Iyer. And I'm Sham Shawan. And um, we are a branch of the ISBHPK in San Antonio. We have other schools located around the country, um, ISBHPK Houston, ISBHPK um, Albuquerque, and Virginia. ISBHPK is the Israelite School of Biblical History and Practical Knowledge. Um, today, our topic is going to go over what was God's intention when he created mankind? You know, because for years in America, our people, the so-called Negroes, the so-called West Indians, so-called Haitians, so-called Dominicans, so-called Cubans, Puerto Ricans, Native Americans, and so-called Mexicans have fought their tails off for equality. We have fought to change legislation and to vote for legislation to make sure all the laws and the, the ways that this land is governed would be, would be established in a fair and equal fashion. We would always march and we'd always protest for equality. That's what Martin Luther King did. That's what many of our leaders did. And we've, stri we've, st we've strived very vigorously to make sure we were all equal. But we have to even find out, getting outside of this fight that we've had in America, how did God look at equality? Did God look at everybody that was created on earth and felt that everybody was equal? Or did the Most High have particular people that he loved more than others? So to find this answer out, we got to go on the scriptures and go from the Old and New Testament to get a better understanding of what was God's intention when he created the earth, when he created mankind. The first verse we're going to go into today is Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 3, then 7 through 9. Deuteronomy <clears throat> chapter 32 verse 3 Because I will publish the name of the Lord Ascribe ye greatness unto our God Read on Verse 7 Remember the days of old So once again the Most High is taking us back To the days of old when, when creation was established When he established mankind Read on Consider the years of many generations Ask thy father and he will show thee Thy elders and they will tell thee. So it was it was understood how the Most High looked at mankind back in the day. There was no secret as to how the Most High looked at man and how he wanted to deal with man from the beginning. What was his intentions in the beginning? Read on. Verse 8. When the Most High divided to the nation. I need you to read that again for the audience. Read it again. When the Most High divided to the nation's. Their inheritance. So, from the beginning of the world, when the Most High made different nations, different nationalities, different peoples, different tongues, different languages, his first notion was to divide the nations their inheritance. Every nation had a particular land mass that was theirs. Every nation had a particular land or a lot that was allocated to their people. God from the beginning never intended us to be in a melting pot like we are in America. God never intended us from the beginning for us to um, share languages, share information, share history, share cultures. From the beginning, there was a division that God set up for nations. Read on. When he separated the sons of Adam. God separated the sons of Adam. Every son, every child, every nationality that came outside of Adam. The intention was for them to be separated. Read on. He set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. So as we're going in this verse, we understand that Mosiah wanted division. He wanted separation. He never wanted us to integrate. The notion of integration, the notion of all nations coming together under one banner, was the opposite of God's design from the beginning. So understanding that Mosai wanted division, he wanted separation, he also made it clear that while he was dividing the nations their lands, their locations, their lots, that he was basing these divisions off of getting Israel, the nation of Israel, our people, the so-called Negroes, West Indians, Haitians, Dominicans, Central Americans, South Americans, Puerto Ricans, Cubans, Seminole Indians, um, Argentinians, so-called Mexicans. All those people were supposed to get their land first. And once he established our people's land, then he was going to sit back here and give everybody else their land. 
Read on. Verse 9. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. So out of all the portions of the earth, God's portion was Israel. Then he established everybody else to live the way they needed to live. Mm -hmm. Everybody had their own gods, their own philosophies, their own outlook about life. But when you read from the beginning... This is how we have to understand how the Most High is now. We can't sit back here and make sentimental decisions. We can't make emotional um, conclusions as to what God's intentions were. I can't speak for God. I can only go in the Bible and let the Word speak to me. And when we read in these scriptures, he tells us that the nations were not meant to be unified. They were meant to be separated. And he also specifically said out of all these nations that were supposed to be separated and divided, Israel was the lot of the Most High's inheritance. That was the group of people that he was focusing on. Now, this verse really sounds controversial because this isn't the sentiment of the world as we know it. But it also shows us how far we have detached ourselves mm -hmm. from the word of God. And that's what we're going to learn. As we keep reading, this is not the only verse that pinpoints this concept. The next verse we're going to go to is Leviticus chapter 20, verse 24 through 26. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 24 through 26. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 24. But I have said unto you, ye shall inherit their land, mm -hmm. and I will give it unto you to possess it. A land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your power, which ye have sep which have separated you from other people. So once again, this is the Mosai talking to us again and saying, listen, I'm going to give you this land that's flowing with milk and honey. The crazy thing is that land that was flowing with milk and honey was present day Israel. But before the Israelites were going to be awarded it, it was inhabited by other nations. It was inhabited by your Canaanites, your mm -hmm. Parasites, your Jebusites, all your Ites. Your, we can read that breakdown in Deuteronomy chapter 7. The nations had control and jurisdiction over that landmass. But the Most High promised, he said, listen, I'm going to give you this land flowing of milk and honey, this bountiful area of the world. Because I am going to uproot everybody that's living there presently, and I'm going to give it to you. And the intention was, I was severing you off from everybody else. It is super important that we understand this was God's feelings towards us. The number one problem that our people face now, we do everything in our power to assimilate, mm -hmm. to fit in, to belong. to belong, to adapt into a place that was never meant for us to be a part of. God let us know very clearly that there was a severing that had to happen, a separation, a cutting off. That was God's will. This is not a war in the eyes will or Shamshuan's will. This is what the word of God tells us. You're going to keep hearing words throughout these scriptures in this class today about severing, um, dividing, um, dividing lots outside of Israel. You're going to read this all throughout the scriptures today. We're going to see this reoccurring theme keep going on. So let's keep going. We're going to jump from verse 24 to verse 26. Verse 26. And ye shall be a holy, and ye shall be holy unto me. For I the Lord am holy, and have severed you from other people that you should be mine. So once again, the most I severed us from other people with the intention that we be his. As you read on, you're going to realize there, the severing was for a reason. The severing was to make sure our focus and our intention was pure. The severing was meant so that we wouldn't be distracted by heathen gods. Wouldn't be distracted by the influences of the nations. Right. Also, when he says that holy, holy unto him, because he's holy, that word holy also means true or set apart, but it also means consecrated. And the word consecrated means to be set aside for a divine purpose. Now, it's showing you that not everybody in the earth was created and to be set aside for a divine purpose. Perfect. So we're going to take that from there and go to Exodus chapter 33 and verse 16. Based off what Shamshu was saying, he's Mosai is saying that he had a greater purpose for our people. And if we can learn what that greater purpose was for, 
we'd be able to tap back into our power source so we can sit back and get back in God's good graces. Okay? Because this is the ultimate purpose of, of why we read the scriptures, of why we're trying to come back to the Lord. So we can tap into what were our intentions were, what we were intended to be made for. Okay? Mm -hmm. Read on. Exodus chapter 33, verse 16. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? It is not in that thou goest with us, so shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. So what Moses was asking is, what is the sign, or what is, what is it going to be, what do I need to see that we have found grace in your sight, O Father? And the thing that, that was the indicator that we had found grace in the Most High sight was that we were separated from the nations. And we were put back into our power source where we can serve the Most High the way we want to serve the Most High. And this is the whole point of this whole class. Is that if we understand that the more we sever from this place, the closer we're going to be connected to the Heavenly Father. If we just accept that and accept that concept, we'd be able to go a lot farther than being in this competition with the nations to prove our equality. The, 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 the purpose of our existence was never to prove equality. Mm -hmm. The purpose of our existence was to separate ourselves to establish what our true purpose was. Um, you got anything on that? You good? No, I just, uh, just on the next verse, the Most High confirmed that it's exactly what Moses interpreted uh, the sign to be. Mm -hmm. And the Most High confirmed it in the next verse. It says, <laughs> And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken. For thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by, by name. Mm -hmm. So the, the Most High is confirming that it is how Moses is going to know that he's with him by keeping him exclusive, the children of Israel exclusive, and belonging and pertaining only to him. Come. So now, the next verse we're going to go to is Esther, chapter 10 and verse 10. Because once again, we're going to go through the Apocrypha, we're going to go through the Bible, we're going to go through multiple sources to confirm how the Most High looked at our people in comparison to the rest of the world and did he look at us the same way in the same light as he did the rest of the people around us okay once again we're trying to sit back here and fight for equal rights we have been trying to fight for equal rights equal pay we've been dealing with discrimination we're sitting back here and dealing with the problems in this society from a totally wrong perspective we're trying to sit back here and fight in this kingdom for equal rights equal pay, equal opportunities, when God told us from the beginning, listen, it was never supposed to be a competition with the nations. It was never supposed to be a fight with the so-called white men about who should be get this job or, or whether it's that um, affirmative Robinson. action or J Jackie Robinson or this fight for equality. It was never supposed to be about that. It was supposed to be about separating ourselves from this place so the most High can pull us out and put us back into our land, into our rightful position. That's what this was about. Okay? Mm -hmm. Let's read um, Esther chapter 10 and verse 10. Esther chapter 10 verse 10. Therefore hath he made two lots. This one with the most high. Let's read um, verse 10, verse 9 real quick. Esther chapter, one, uh, chapter 10 verse 9. And my nation is this Israel, which cried to the most high and were saved. For the Lord hath saved his people, and the Lord hath delivered us from all those evils. And the Most High hath wrought signs and great wonders, which have not been done among the Gentiles. Therefore hath he made two lots, one for the people of God, and another for all the Gentiles. So the Most High is saying, or the scriptures are saying, the Most High had two purposes, two lots, two directions, two separate pathways. Two determinations. Two determinations of the direction that the Most High had for them. One was for the nations, and the other one was for the Israelites. He's shown us consistently that when he created the earth, when he created the world, he set Israel aside to do great things for him. They had different roles to play. Our role was to serve him and be that beacon and that example of how to live the right way in God's eyes. The nations were set aside to do what they were going to do. Mm -hmm. And the quicker that we understand this concept, the quicker we'd be, we, we would take get out of this mindset of fighting for equality, fighting for this, fighting for this, versus understanding to separate and to come together and to unify is the solution. We should be focusing on us unifying and coming together versus trying to fit into a society that doesn't want us. 
The quicker we can understand this as a whole, the quicker we can get saved like we got saved in the book of Esther in the Bible. Because the only reason the Israelites came together and got, and got saved from the Persian destruction was because we unified back then. So once again, the focus is uniting versus assimilation. And if we can grasp that concept, we'd be in a lot better position in life, in this life. Okay? Let's go to Ecclesiasticus in the Apocrypha, chapter 33, and verse 10. Ecclesiasticus, chapter 33, verse 10. And all men are from the ground, and Adam was created of earth. Mm -hmm. In much knowledge the Lord hath divided them. So we're still dealing with Adam. We go back to Adam because we're dealing with the beginning again. And the most High, all throughout the scriptures shows us from the beginning, when God made Adam, what was his focus when he was putting this whole thing together? When he was putting mankind together, what was his mindset? What was his intention? Where was his head at? Read verse 10 again. Verse 10. And all men are from the ground, and Adam was created of earth. In much knowledge, the Lord hath divided them. So, in much knowledge, the Lord has divided them. This wasn't some happenstance situation, right. or this wasn't just some, oh, oops, I made a mistake, um... Initially, I was supposed to divide them, but now we're in the, the 1990s and the 2000s, and now I want them to unite. That wasn't the intention. With much knowledge, he understood that the nations had to be divided. The different people on earth had to be divided. The East Indian man needed to be with the East Indian woman and their people. The African man in Africa needed to stay with their people. The European man in Europe needed to stay with their people. The Israelites need to stay with their people. This was, the, this was the, the focus. This was the mindset from the beginning. And this is what we don't want to understand. But keep going. And made their ways diverse. The Mosai made their ways diverse, their right. habits diverse, their cultures. their cultures diverse, music, their music, their spirit, diet, who they pray to, their inclinations spiritually were all diverse. And he, the purpose of that was to keep those diversities to themselves. Read on. Verse 12. Some of them he blessed and exalted, and some of them hath he sanctified and set near himself. But some of them hath he cursed and brought low and turned out of their places. This is a tough concept for people to understand. That God from the beginning, he says some people, some nations, he blessed and exalted, made them powerful, made them better. Some, he says, some he sanctified through the scriptures and set near himself. He sanctified and set us near himself because he wanted our people to be close to him. Mm -hmm. And when you bring somebody close, that means you're keeping also others at bay and at a distance. And we don't want to, we don't want to accept that God played favorites from the beginning. That God had a favorite child, he had a favorite nation, and other people, he didn't look the same, he didn't look at them the same way. What we don't want to accept is everybody has to play a role in this world. So we can't pick and choose what role we want to play. We have to accept what role God chose for each and every one of us as a people. So, he says, some people were made to be exalted, some people were made to be sanctified and near himself. He says, but some of them hath he cursed and brought low and turned out of their places. So God from the, from the time of Adam made the determination that certain people, certain nations were going to be set aside from him. They were going to be cursed. So once again, he's showing us there was never meant to be equality across the board. Right. It was never meant to be that way. Everybody had to play a role. And the quicker everybody in the world accepts their roles, there will be peace in this world. The problem is the roles have been reversed. And the, the, the people that were supposed to be nearest to the Most High have been punished. And they're not in the right set right now because, once again, we have lost source to who we were. Mm -hmm. This whole world is flipped upside down because nobody knows what role each nation is supposed to play. If the so-called black man, the so-called Mexican man, the so-called Puerto Rican man, the so-called uh, indigenous Central American, South American, and Caribbean island person just accepted 
That they were God's chosen people. And that they were supposed to live a life that was closely associated with serving God. Then the most I can put this, set this whole world back in order. Creation is waiting on the manifestation of the Son of God. You read that in Romans 8 and 19. Everybody's waiting for us to figure it out. To figure that, hey, we were God's chosen. We were chosen to be set aside. Let me get my head out of my you-know-what and get right to serving God. Let me choose to learn to serve God and not wickedness and see how far that takes me. Okay, um, read on. Verse 13. As the clay is in the potter's hand. So now the Mosiah is explaining the process of creation. Obviously, the potter is the Heavenly Father. And the clay are all the participants that the Most High created. So he says, as the clay is in the potter's hands or the Most High's hands. Read on. To fashion it at his pleasure. We were made to perform the will of the Heavenly Father. When I was born on earth, when Shamshuan was born, when the brothers and sisters was born on earth, we had a purpose. We were created for a reason. And I can't wake up in the morning and say, you know what? I'm not going to be the person I was intended to be. I don't have that choice. If we were, play, or, were, were purposed and created to play the role of the righteous, then damn it, we had to be that. And the wicked was chosen to be the wicked also. This is the will of the Heavenly Father. This is really how God thinks. And the problem is most of us don't read the Bible enough to really understand God's will. We take people's words for it and we kind of go off what we feel mm -hmm. versus what the scripture said. Right. Okay? Read on to verse 13. So man is in the hand of him that made him to render to them as liketh him best. Con. So, once again, the Father was just showing us he had a chosen group of people, and everybody else on the earth had to play a role. And the quicker that we can come to the acceptance of our roles, now then the earth would be at peace. Everything will be set aside the right way. Okay? Once again, this is not my opinion. We can go all throughout the Bible. This is God's words. This is not how I feel. This is not why I wake up in the morning with some hatred in my heart or some anger or a chip on my shoulder. It has right. nothing to do with that. This is strictly unbiased. Un, it's not complicated. It's simple. It's clear. It's what the scripture says. Okay. We're going to let that go and go to Amos chapter 3 verse 1 and 2. Amos chapter 3 verse 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel. So now, we're talking about how the Most High is upset at the children of Israel because even though the children of Israel were intended to be godly, the children of Israel were intended to be, um, to set near God. All throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelations, we consistently went against God's will. So as much as I'm talking about everybody has to play their role, we're the number one culprits of not playing their role. We kept wanting to be like the nations. When you read all throughout the scriptures, we kept wanting to be like the nations, live like the nations, break the law like the nations. And the crazy thing is the Most High understood this about us, which is why he wanted us separated and divided in the first place. Mm -hmm. So we wouldn't want to be tempted to pick up their negative habits. Just like if I have a child and, and I'm neighbors to a kid who's a bad kid and bad influence. What would I want to do to my kid if there's a neighbor next to me who's, who's sitting back here burning things and throwing, <laughs> and throwing rocks at cars and, 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 getting in a, and stealing candy at the dang store? Do I want my kid hanging out with that bad kid? No, of course not. No, of course not. This is what the Most High is saying. I don't want my children of Israel hanging out with these bad nations that want to serve other gods and break the law all the time. It's common sense. This isn't mystical. This isn't spiritualism. It's, it's not a very difficult concept to accept. Okay. So now, we're reading verse three, chapter 3 and 1, talking about how the Most High is angry at the children of Israel. Read on. O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying. So he's, he's reminding Israel, I brought you guys up from Israel, or from Egypt. I brought you guys up from bondage. Read on. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. So we go into this verse to prove once again 
out of all the nations from the time of Adam. He says, you Israelites, the so-called Negroes, West Indians, Central Americans, South Americans, Caribbean Islands, Native Americans, so-called Mexicans, those people were the only people ever on earth that he knew. We're the only families that he had a relationship with, that he worked with, that he that he Chast dealt with, that he chastised, chastised, that he knew. We were the only ones. So once again, this whole Bible was intended for one people. And it's the stories that chronicled the life and the ups and downs of one people. People just because the whole rest of the world got it got their their filthy paws on this doesn't mean it was theirs. It was always about one people, and that's the point. But he says, "You guys are the only ones that I knew of all the families of the earth." Read on. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquity. And this is why the Most High stings the so-called Negro, West Indians, South Americans, Central Americans, all the people on the Israelite side. That's why he stings us. The hardest. Because we should know better. We have been taught. We have had history and examples of the Most High coming through for us all these times. This is why right now in the world we're on the bottom of the totem pole. Because we were punished for not accepting our role in this world. So what the Most High is saying is, okay, you want to be like the nations? Then be in the bottom of the nation's kingdom and see how it feels. And that's why we're in this situation now. The only way we're going to get out of it is to come back to who we are. But I don't want to go too far on that topic. We'll deal with that later. Let's keep focusing on the same reoccurring theme. God only knew the family of Israel out of all the families of the world. That means if I only knew this, this family, what about the other families that existed for hundreds of years? Right. He didn't care too much about them. He let them do what they was going to do. But like you said, just to expound on that just a little bit. We have, we've always had an affinity to be like the mobsters of other families, of other nations, yeah. the, the gangsters. The, John uh, Gotti. The John Gotti, yeah. The, Al Capone. Yeah, we, we see Scarface. Scarface, you know, and we see the Nino Brown characters that, you know, we play these roles that were invented by other nations, but it attracts us. Yep. That kind of lifestyle attracts us, the fast life, the, the hustle, the, the, gang, the, the gang banging. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's attractive to us, but that's not the role we were intended to play by the Most High. God. And once again, this is why the Most High wanted us separate from the beginning. He didn't want us playing in the sandbox with these thugs down the street named Al Capone and Scarface. All that gangster stuff came from the so-called white man. You want to be like them. Let's go to Joel 2 and 27. Joel chapter 2 verse 27. Mm -hmm. And ye shall know that I am, I am the, <clears throat> excuse me. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. So once again, we keep reading the same things. Different chapters, different books. He is in the midst of Israel. He has always been in the midst of us. That just means he's been involved in our day-to-day -day spiritual maturation. He's been involved in today with our spiritual falls, our ups, our downs. He's been involved in our life. He's showing us where his, his eye has been fixated on. He hasn't been focusing on the affairs of the nations. The so-called white man, the so-called Japanese, so-called Chinese man. He's not worried about them. He deals with us because we're the ones that were given the laws. We're the ones that was given the, the, the oracles of God. We were the ones that were invested into. And because we were invested into, he demands more from us. Okay, let that read on. Read on 27, I'm sorry. And Joel chapter 2 verse 27. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else. He's making it clear, none else. He's no other nation's God. He's no other nation's God. Can you hold that and go to Malachi 3 and 6? Because we keep hearing what he is. We keep hearing that without a shadow of a doubt, he's just dealing with the Israelites. I mean, we have tons of scriptures more to prove this, so we have a long way to go. So just get, get, your, get your popcorn ready and just get ready to listen, because we have more points to stack on this concept. But let's give me a Malachi 3 and 6 if you can. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6. For I am the Lord. I change not. So once again, he keeps telling us he doesn't change. So whatever concepts he's pounding on us about how he's in the midst of Israel and none else, he's not changing this. Just because this society now is this great melting pot with every influence and every um, um, societal belief 
every type of negative uh, mindset or religion is here or belief or lust is amplified here. Just because it's here doesn't mean this is the place that God wants us to have. Or this is the place that God wants us to be down the line. Okay? Let's keep going. I don't want I don't want to spill the beans because we have yeah. more class to go. I'll finish too. that verse. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. So he keeps saying, listen, I don't change, so I'm not giving up on you. I don't change, so I'm not going to sit back here and jump ship just because you're messing up. I'm not going to go let you go and go to the nations and make them um, the people I focus on. He's starting and he started with Israel, and he's going to finish with Israel. That's what this verse is saying. Now, let's go back to our line of scriptures and hit up um, 2 Ezra, okay. chapter 6, and verse 54. Because once again, like you see, have plenty more verses to tackle on this topic. 2 Ezra, chapter 6, verse 54. Now, we're going to jump in the middle after 56 and go to Isaiah 40, so just be ready. I'll have Isaiah ready, ready to go into it. I got Isaiah, you can do it. Just read Ezra. 2 Ezra, chapter 6, verse 54. And after these, Adam also... Whom thou madest Lord of all thy creatures. So once again, we're going back to Adam. And it's, it's so important that in the beginning of this class, we go back to the, to the, um, the roots of how things were created. We go back to Adam so much to let us know, hey, what was God doing when he dealt with Adam? What was he thinking? What was the plan? What was the goal when he put Adam in charge of all creations? Read on. He said, of him come we all. And the people also of whom thou hast chosen. He said all man came from Adam, but he also specified the chosen came from Adam. Read on. All this have I spoken before thee, O Lord, because thou madest the world for our sake. Thou, Lord, madest the world for our sake, the chosen's sake. Once again, you have to understand big picture when he made this place. He had one people. That he was focusing on in mind when he made creation. These are what the scriptures are saying. He had one nation in mind. Read on. All this have I spoken before thee, O Lord, because thou madest the world for our sakes. Exactly. Read on. As for the other people. So he's, he's, he's letting you know that other people were created as well. He's letting you know that the nations were created. But he's like, listen, the other, as for everybody else besides my chosen, what was his intention? What was, how did he look at the nations when he first made them? Read on. Which also came of Adam. Thou hast said that they are nothing. He's telling you that the nations are nothing to him. And don't forget that last verse you read in Malachi said, God don't change. So if the rest of the nations that aren't Judah, the so-called Negroes, Jamaicans and West Indians, which are tribe of Benjamin, Levi Haitians, Simeon Dominicans, Zebulon Central Americans, Ephraim Puerto Ricans, Cubans Manessa, Gad North American Indians, Reuben Seminole Indians, Asher South Americans, um, Naphtali Argentinian and Chileans, Issachar Mexicans. If you're not one of those people, which were the chosen, everybody else in God's eyes were looked upon as nothing. Read on. But be like unto spittle. He looked at them as when I'm, listen, I have a little nasal drip here. If I sat back here and spit right now, I wouldn't think twice about what happens to the spit. Is it going to get stepped on? Is it going to evaporate in the sun? Is a dog going to lick it? What's going to happen to it? Am I going to think about that? No. When if I spit, I'm not going to worry about the consequences of what happens to the spit after it comes out of my esophagus. This is how God looks at the rest of the nations. It ain't personal. I'm not sitting back here like, yeah, right. I want to tell the nations that they ain't they're nothing but spit. Right. We're just trying to inform the public how God feels about the nations from the beginning. Because what we're showing is that the Mosai had a determined value for the children of Israel and a determined value for the other nations. And the crazy thing is, he's letting you know this is, came from the time of Adam. So the nations didn't even do nothing to be looked upon as spit. So this isn't some vendetta or I, I was pissed off one day and the nations got me mad and I just sat back here and cursed them. No. God's design was for the chosen to be focused on and the rest of the nations to be neglected. So when I sit back here and I see the other nations not believe in God, when I see the other nations live their life and do their thing and follow Allah and follow all the other gods, I'm like, they're supposed to. 
The rest of the nations are not supposed to follow God. They're not supposed to do what the scriptures are saying they're supposed to do. They're going to do their thing. They're going to do their role. You got these guys doing satanic um, rituals and killing babies and doing all kind of craziness. They're, they're supposed to do that. Right. That's what people that aren't connected and aren't chosen do. So we can't be surprised when the nations function like they're supposed to function. Everybody's doing what they're supposed to do, except for us. We're the dummies that want to fit in with the world. Versus understand that from the beginning, we weren't supposed to be a part of the world. And if we understood that, we'd be empowered. We won't be calling ourselves black men and black women. Right. We'll actually have a dang nation. A colored folk. Versus a, 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 yeah, colored folk. Black folk. Versus we won't be colored, won't be classified as a color, we'd be classified as a nation, which we're supposed to be. The nation of Israel. Read on. And has likened the abundance of them. The abundance, he says he likened the abundance of the nations. Read on. Like uh, uh, the abundance of them unto a drop that falleth from a vessel. Once again, if I have a big bucket of water, and I'm in the country, and I went to the feeding trough to go feed the pigs. Or to sit back here and feed the horses. Or give them water, give them drink. And I get a, bu a whole bucket of water. And I take this bucket from point A to point B. And in the process of me going from point A to point B, I drop a little water. Am I going to drop my bucket and mourn this little, this little drop of water that left my bucket? No. No. I'm not going to worry. About, I'm not going to concern over a little water. There's a saying that you can't cry over what? Spill milk. Spill milk. Let me focus on what's in front of me. So once again, God is showing me how he feels about the nations. He's showing us all how he feels about the nations. He's not crying over spilled milk. He's not crying over what happens to the nations and what affects the nations. He's not angry about what, what the nations are doing. The nations are doing what they're supposed to do, which is live for them. Okay? Read on. And now, O oh Lord, behold, these heathen which have ever been reputed as nothing, have begun to be lords over us and to devour us. And the crazy thing, this is, this is what Ezra is saying, like, man, these nations that were supposed to sit back here and be looked upon as nothing are lords over us. They're in power over us. Why? Half the reason is we want to keep being wicked like the nations. We want to tap into the flesh like the nations. The crazy thing is we were meant to live an honorable life. Discipline. To live a disciplined, honorable life in the eyes of God. But the crazy thing, we're too lazy. We don't like writ routine and discipline and sacrifice. So what we want to do is we want to we want to ease the way out like the nations. We want freedom. We want, we want freedom. We want comfort. We want the easy way out versus having to live a disciplined life. And this is why the nations are over us. Because we want to sit back here and look for the easy way out versus accepting our roles. Listen, you can't just be looked upon or noted as being chosen and I just I don't have to do anything about it. I don't have to live a certain way. I, if I was chosen by God to be special, let me put the work in to justify my calling. And this is what our people hate to do. We don't want to sit back and just work hard to justify being chosen. So, let's keep going. Verse 58. But we thy people... Whom thou hast called thy firstborn. Once again, God called Israel his firstborn. Read on. The only begotten and thy fervent lover. I got to hold this. I'm so sorry. I messed up and I, I messed up on the verse. Um, I want I want you to read the last part of 56 real quick. And it's likened. And it's likened uh, the abundance of them unto a drop that falleth from a vessel. I messed up because there's another verse in Isaiah 40 in verse 15. In 17, that says the exact same thing. So he's recreating the same mindset. He's telling us how he feels about the nations multiple times. I'm going to read this. All right. And it, all, it shows you also that the, the Most High understood his intention, but also the prophets and the patriarchs of the Bible also understood the mind of the Most High because they validated it. Ezra, the prophet, validated it right here how the Most High felt about the nations. And where we're going right now is to Isaiah. And Isaiah, also a prophet, understood the, the, the intentions and the roles and the value of the other nations versus the children of Israel. And we're going to read Isaiah chapter 40, but can we start at verse 1 and 2 real quick? Um, well, 
that's been part of that's down the oh, okay. line. Well, that's um, down the line. Okay. I promise you, we got Okay, for, verse 15. I didn't know. We're going to, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's over here. Yeah, that's understandable. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're going to do 15. 15. I got it. Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket. Very similar passage, almost saying the exact same thing versus what Ezra said as being a, a, a drop that falleth from a vessel. A vessel is a container. Mm -hmm. A container is a cup or a vessel or a vase saying the same thing. They understood that the value of the nations was very small. Go ahead. And are counted as the small dust of the balance. Now, when you stand on a scale, you don't get down on all fours and blow the dust off the scale before you stand on it. Neither do you wipe the dust off the produce scale when you're putting your apples and grapes and oranges and bananas in the, in, in, on the scale. Because the dust is very insignificant. And this is exactly what the Most High is showing you about how he feels about the nations. He, he quantifies the nations as being equivalent to dust on a scale. Very small. It's there, but it really doesn't it's matter. It's insignificant. It doesn't have a, a great effect on the total weight of what you're measuring. On the grand scheme of things, the nations don't really mean much. They don't mean much at all. He exactly. said, like, like the dust on a balance. Go ahead. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. And he says, when you add up all the nations, even all the nations of the islands, like the, 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 the Polynesians, poly means many, nations means islands, there's thousands of islands in the Philippines, thousands of islands in, in Polynesia, Melanesia, Micronesia, uh, all over the, the, the South Pacific Islanders. You can add everybody up and took the totality of all the nations. Don't really mean much to the Most High. Exactly. Let's jump down to verse 17. All nations before him are as nothing. Every nation to the most high equal or amount to what nothing so you can pretty much equivalent the nation's value to the most high as being zero a zero sum balance right <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna get technical on it hey right. now we know that the, they have some value because the most high did leave the nations behind to check and chastise the nation of israel when they're out of order mm -hmm. and that's about the only purpose that they really serve other than playing the role of uh, playing their particular role yep go ahead and they are counted to him Less than nothing. And you got okay. You got dung. You got cow manure. You got horse manure. You can at least take horse manure, mix it with some soil, and make some great fertilizer. Yep. He said, but the nations are even less than that. Yep. So we're, I don't want to say less than crap, but he's saying that they don't, they can't be used for he the said, mo for God's purpose. For His purpose, they can't be used for God's purpose. They can be used for their own purpose. Right. They have their own traits and their own skill sets and their own strengths. But in the realm, in a spiritual realm, in God's realm, they're insignificant. And that's the whole point. This is He's just showing us about, hey, we're supposed to accept ourselves as being spiritual people that are trying to build a spiritual world for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And in a spiritual realm, the nations don't fit. The way they think don't fit. Their mode of operation doesn't fit God's mode of operation. From the beginning. From the time of Adam. Mm -hmm. Read on. He says, less than nothing and vanity. And vanity, the word vanity means vain or useless. Exactly. So it, it's showing you the, the totality of how the Most High looks at the nation of Israel versus the, uh, uh, the, 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 the Gentiles or in Hebrew, the Goyim or the other nations that, the, that came from Adam that were not chosen to play the role of the holy or not chosen to play the role of the consecrated. They were not set apart to fulfill a divine purpose or execute the law, statutes, and commandments of the Most High. Okay, now let's go back to 2 Ezra chapter 6 and 57 and 58 and 59. 2 Ezra chapter 6 verse 57. And now, O Lord, behold, these heathen, which have ever been reputed as nothing. You see how these verses blend in with each other. He's saying these nations were reputed or looked upon as nothing. And Read reputed on. means having a reputation. They've mm -hmm. always had the reputation to, to, have, to have no value in the sight of the Most High. Mm -hmm. Have begun to be lords over us. And to devour us. Exactly. So he's showing us that now the nations are in, on top of us in power and we're subservient to them, which is happening to this day. Mm -hmm. Which is why we're out here sitting back here fighting for rights, fighting for equality, fighting for equal pay, equal jobs, opportunities, our 40 acres and a mule. We're fighting for these rights when it should never have been this way in the first place. Read on. He says, but we thy people whom thou hast called thy firstborn, thy only begotten, and thy fervent lover... Are given into his 
are given into their hands. So once again, he keeps showing us that we were his firstborn. We were his fervent lover. He had as a passion for us. He has a passionate love for us. So whenever we turn our back on him, he gets angry. And when he gets angry, he punishes us hard because he loves us. And this is how we have to understand why the Most High has hit our people so hard. Okay, read on. Verse 59. If the world now be made for our sakes. Because the world was made for our people's sakes. Read on. Why do we not possess an inheritance with the world? How long shall this endure? So that's a real question. Like, why is it, if we were chosen to be great, he says, if we're chosen to be great, why don't we possess an inheritance with the world? We're going to go into this question a little bit later in the class. But it's a very important concept to think about because we're going to keep reading about these chosen concepts, these scriptures that kind of show that we were always God's firstborn. He loved us. We were meant to be special. But the crazy thing is we have not lived up to our side of the bargain. And we'll expound on that later. But now I want to kind of go into more history as to why and how we were chosen and how that started. We, we, we know that in from the time of Adam what God's plan was or what mm -hmm. his... His intention. His intentions were. Mm -hmm. We understand that. But now once once we understand his intentions from Adam, how did it kind of sort out to where he specified who that chosen seed was even more? Mm -hmm. Okay? So now we're going to go to Genesis chapter 17, verse 1 through 7, so we can get a better understanding of once we know that from the beginning God wanted the, 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 the chosen to, to go through Adam, now we have to find out, okay, after it was Adam, who was the next person or individual that the Most High worked with to have that chosen lineage to go through? Okay? So let's get Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, to verse 7. Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me, and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. So the most I approached Abram and said, listen, walk perfect, and I'm going to make a contract with you. I'm going to make a deal with you. And I'm going to multiply your, you and your seed exceedingly. Okay, this is how it started. This is how that covenant started. This is how the, the, the nation of Israel began to be formed. Okay, read on. And Abram fell on his face, and the most High talked with him, saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. So he's telling Abraham that he was going to be a father, or Abram, he was going to be a father of many nations. Read on. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. So from his lineage... Kings, or kings and nations were going to spring forth out of Abram's lineage. Read on. Verse 7. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant. So he's letting you know this also that he said many nations were going to come out of Abram. But he said he was going to establish his covenant between his seed. So it was one of his seeds that he was going to establish an everlasting covenant with. A generational covenant covenant with so it was, it was going to be one nation he was going to consistently deal with forever he said between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant read on to be a power unto thee and to thy seed after thee so he's saying that he was going to be a power to this one seed out of the many nations that abram was going to bring forth from his lineage Okay. And just in case you didn't know what a covenant is, a covenant is a contract or an agreement. Mm -hmm. And so this contract or agreement was ex exclusively between Abram and the Most High, and then the one that the Most High chose that came from the seed of Abram. Not all of the nations that came from Abram, but one particular seed that came from Abram. Okay. Now, let's jump to verse 19. So now we understand from verse 1 to 7 that the Most High chose Abram to work through his lineage okay and let's continue verse 17 then abraham fell upon no, no, verse, his, 19. verse 19 and the most High said 
Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him. And this is the actual application of actually verse 7, because in between 7 and um, 18, we read about how Abram already had a child named Ishmael. So he already had a nation that already had come through his loins. Ishmael ended up being the progenitor or the father of the Arab people. As a matter of fact, let's just read. Um, let's read verse 17 like you said. It was, it was probably best we did that. Verse 17. Then Ab Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abraham said unto the Most High, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. So, hey, even Abram, who, who had already had Ishmael as his son, was like, listen, I know you told me that I was going to deal with Sarah and have a child, but let, it, let, let, the, let the blessing and the covenant go through Ishmael. He's already here. He's my son. He's my firstborn son. But read on. Let's see how, what God said when, he, when, when Abram approached him with this. And the Most High said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. So what he's saying is, hey, I know you have a son, Ishmael, but I'm establishing my covenant with Isaac. So now we're understanding that this everlasting covenant was initiated from the time of Adam. He said, through the seed of Adam, I was going to initiate this covenant. Now we're starting to see, okay, we got Adam. Now we have Abraham. He said, okay, this, this everlasting covenant is going to be going through you, through your lineage. Now he's getting even more specific. He's saying, now, Abraham, you have a lot of children, but it's going to go through Isaac. This covenant is going through Isaac. Okay? This everlasting covenant is going through Isaac's lineage. Let's keep going to 21, all the way through. All right, 21. No, through 20. 21. Through 21, yeah. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. So he said, I heard you. I know you want good things for Ishmael. Read on. Behold, I have blessed him. And will make him fruitful. So the Arab nation is a powerful nation. Very rich in, 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 in resources. minerals, resources. They, they were blessed. Gold. And, and gold, riches. That's what the Most High said in, um, up in the Apocrypha. I think it was Ecclesiastes 33. That some nations were meant to be great. Right. He made this nation great. And he said other nations were meant to be alongside of him. And that was us. Specifically through Abraham and Isaac. And we're going to go to another person in a second. Read on. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac. That covenant, that, that decision that he was going to make, he was going to be connected with Israel long term. Only was going to go through Isaac, not Ishmael. Read on. He says... Which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. Okay. So now we understand that the most I did with Abraham and Isaac. And through these two genealogies, you is going to get the chosen people. Now we're going to get that last, that last genealogy to get everything to be connected together. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 10. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 through 10. I know we're kind of jumping um, in this, but I want to kind of show... That um, that the Most High was actually dealing. Matter of fact, let me see. Give me one second. I might want to go to Genesis real quick and just do twenty-five. When we when we see how the Most High separates and chooses one from the other. Let me see. One second, y'all. No, we'll do that later. Let's do um, Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy verse 4 through 10. Chapter 6, verse 4 through 10. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our power is one Lord. Now, this is a prayer that it that is spoken, that was spoken from Israel from the beginning. And even when you read a lot of history books, a lot of the um, North American Indians, a lot of the um, they, they 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 prayed this same credo. prayer and credo mm -hmm. when the um conquistadors came down from the from Europe. To, um, to talk to them. They understood this credo because this was a Hebrew Israelite credo that was always spoken of and prayed on when we, when we, were, when we were dealing with the Father. Mm -hmm. Read on. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our power is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy power with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. So he's saying we were supposed to teach our children the law, teach our children how to serve the Most High, so where they can be frontlets in their eyes. So that would be the first thing that pops in their eyes when they are going about their day, was that consciousness of the Heavenly Father. Rem constant reminder exactly. that they have a duty and a responsibility to serve the Most High. God. Read on. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. Verse 10. And it shall be, when the Lord thy God shall, ha shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And this is where I was trying to go. The most I dealt with Abraham. Then he dealt with Isaac. Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. The most I ended up choosing to, to funnel that covenant through Jacob. Okay, and Jacob had 12 sons, and those 12 sons became the Israelite nation. And this is where this credo came from, and this is where the focus that the Most High had came from this. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Read on. To give thee great and goodly cities, which thou buildest not. Now I want to go to another verse in Ecclesiastes 44 that kind of ties Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob together. So we can understand this was that those three men... That the Most High chose to work with and work through to establish his nation of people that he only cared about. Okay? So, let's do um, Ecclesiastes chapter 44, verse 1 and 2. Then we're going to jump to 19 through 23. Ecclesiastes chapter 44, verse 1 and 2. Let us now praise famous men and our fathers that begat us. The Lord hath wrought great glory by them. Through his great power from the beginning. Okay, jump to verse 19. We're talking about great famous men in Israel. Verse 19. Verse 19. Abraham was a great father of many people. In glory was there none like unto him. Who kept the law of the Most High and was in covenant with him. So Abraham was the one who the, the covenant was established through with the Most High. Read on. He established He established. The covenant in his flesh. The way the covenant was established in his flesh was from circumcision. Okay. Read on. And when he was proved, he was found faithful. Read on. Therefore, he assured him by an oath that he would bless the nations in his seed, and that thou would multiply him as the dust of the earth, and exalt his seed as the stars, and cause them to inherit from sea to sea, and from river unto the utmost part of the land. Read on. With Isaac did he establish likewise... For Abraham, his father's sake, the blessing of all men and the covenant. So he's letting us know that the covenant transferred down to Isaac. Read on. And it rests upon the head of Jacob. He acknowledged him in his blessing and gave him an heritage and divided his portions among the twelve tribes did he part them. Now we understand how the Most High was thinking when he made it from the beginning. It was, okay, through Adam, I'm going to sit back here, I'm going to pick one particular people that I'm going to work with. And, and that one particular person, people, came through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob's 12 sons, which made up the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is what we get today. And those 12 tribes of Israel was the group of people that God said are going to be on my hip and stay close to me. And I want to keep you away from everybody else in this world, to keep you protected, to save you from the influence that the nations were bringing to the table. Okay? Now, what we're going to do... I want to go to Romans chapter 9 and, and verse 1. We're going to go to like 21. Because right now we're going to also establish. Now we're going to the New Testament. And talk about how the Israelites were still the ones who God was dealing with from the beginning. And how the Mosai looked at everybody else who was a non-Israelite nation. Read that. Romans 9 and 1. Romans chapter 9 verse 1. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. This is Paul saying this. Read on. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, 
according to the flesh. So, so Paul was saying, I wish he, he, Paul was saying he wishes he could take on the curses that Christ went through for his kinsmen according to the flesh, which were Israelites. When you read earlier or later in Romans 10 and 1, Paul, Paul says that he's actually from the tribe of Benjamin. 11, 11 and 1, 11 and 1. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. So Paul was an Israelite himself. And he wished he could take on the curses that Christ took on for his people. Because Christ, I mean, Paul ultimately knew it was about the nation of Israel. Read on. My kinsmen, according to the flesh, mm -hmm. who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption. So once again, he's expressing that the Israelites were the ones who were adopted to the Most High. The Israelites were the ones who were chosen. No other nation was. Read on. And the glory. And the glory means the kingdom. The kingdom is coming to the Israelite people. There's only one specific nation that the Most High is dealing with when it comes to the adoption. Read on. And the covenants. And the covenants, the contract. Once again, the contract went through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 tribes, those Israelites. He keeps repeating. The scriptures keep repeating. Oh, New Testament Apocrypha. It's the same thing. God always wanted the nation of Israel to be the one that was the focal point. And all he wanted back was for us to serve him with gladness and joyfulness of heart. Read on. And the giving of the law. So once again, the law was only given to the Israelites. And when you read in 1 Timothy 1 and 15, it says that you can't sin if you don't know the law. So when it really boils down to Christ came to save sinners. That's what the verse said. Christ came to save sinners. So the only people that could sin are the ones who break the law. So the God was Christ only came to deal with the people who were given the law and weren't following it. So that was the power that the Most High gave us. The law, the oracles of the Most High, the glory, the adoption, the covenants. Read on. And the service of God. The service of God was the priesthood. The only people that could be priests were Israelites. Read on. And the promises. And the promises. The promise of the kingdom. The promise of that land. The promise that the covenant was going to go through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob only was dealt with one people. Read on. Whose are the fathers, and of whom as concerning the flesh, Christ came. He's telling us that Christ came for that flesh. Christ came for the flesh of the Israelite people that were under the law, that were under the covenants that was established from God to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's showing us that linearly, linear, linear, linearly, everything still sticks with Israel from beginning to end. It was right. always about this people. It was never about anybody else. Want to say something? No, I just want to say that we have to understand that when we read the Bible, we're entirely reading about the history, the interactions, the punishments, the judgments, the decision making, the oversight of the Most High dealing with the children of Israel and how they interacted with the rest of, of the nations in the world. It's an entire history book about the culture, the history, and the prophecies, and the promise of, promises of God to the Israelite nation. Okay, now let's keep going. Give me verse, um, yeah, let's keep reading, let's keep reading, verse 6 down. Oh, you want uh, Romans 9 and 6? Yes, sir, we're going to keep reading through okay. 21. Romans chapter 9, verse 6. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. He says, in Isaac was the seed called. So he's showing you just because Abraham, the, the, the covenant went through Abraham, but Abraham had many sons. Abraham had many children. So now the Most High is showing us just because you were a son of Abraham doesn't mean you were an Israelite. Now he's going to break it down because Abraham had, he had sons from Keturah. He had, he, had, he, had, he had Ishmael. He had many children that weren't part of that covenant. Okay, He said Isaac, that son that came from Sarah, was the chosen that the covenant was going to go through. Read on. That is, they which are of the children of the flesh. Which is talking, the children of the flesh is talking about Ishmael. The white woman he had, I mean, the child he had from Hagar. Hagar. That mm -hmm. Hagar, the handmaid. Mm -hmm. that is, that's what he's talking about, the children of the flesh. I mean, that, Hagar, you're right. Hagar. Yeah, Hagar. Read on. He says, These are not the children of God, mm -hmm. but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. The children of promise was counted for the seed. And when the Most High approached Abram, he said, You're going to deal with your wife, your wife Sarai, at, and she's 90, you're 99, and y'all going to have a kid in a year. And that kid is going to be the one where the covenant rests through. And that mm -hmm. kid or that child was Isaac. Read on. 
For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. We just talked about it. Read on. But not only this, but when Rebekah had, when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. So then we go down to Isaac's lineage, and Isaac dealt with Rebekah. That was his wife. Rebekah had twins. So even though Rebekah had twins, we're going to read about how the Most High, what was the intention with these twins. Read on. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to the election might stand, not of works, but of him that called. So once again, the Most High is showing us that hell, um, in, in Rebekah's belly you had um, eventually Jacob and Esau. And he said, listen, it was about election. Esau and Jacob did nothing to earn the right of being chosen or nothing to be to earn the right of being the, the not chosen or the cursed or the punished. Neither child did anything. This is about God's will. So this is not about, hey, the Most High just chose to deal with, with Jacob. It, it, and, and Esau had nothing to do with it. Read on. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. And that was the prophecy. The prophecy was that the first kid that came out was going to serve the second kid that came out of her womb. Read on. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. He shows us. Esau, the Most High, hated. He didn't care about that nation. And as we go over eventual class, and a lot, we're going to break down who Esau was. Esau was a so-called white man. Is a so-called white man. And we'll go into a class that specifies that. But today we're going to focus on how Israel was chosen. And from the beginning, it wasn't what Jacob did. It wasn't what he did. It was the fact that God chose him to be his chosen. And it was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Read on. I want to just bring this out really mm -hmm. quickly. And when it says, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. It was always known throughout the scriptures how the Most High felt about Esau. And you can find this written in the book of uh, Malachi chapter 1, verse uh, 2 and 3. Or verse 2, he says, I have loved you, said the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, said the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau. So this is where it's written that when we read in Romans chapter 9, how Paul... And all the other, Malachi and all the other prophets knew how the Most High felt about Esau. So I wanted to just bring that out, that it was in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Come. So now let's go to verse 14, because if I'm a layman person and I'm just reading this like it's a novel, I might get some feelings off the fact that God just said, I'm going to choose one group of people over another. Right. I'm going to choose one nation over another. I'm going to choose one people and, and look at them as being more special than everybody else. Now let's read that. Verse 14. Verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with the Most High? Because this is what people seem to take offense to. Like, that's not my God. God, My God wouldn't hate other nations. My God will love everybody equally. Hate is a strong word. Hate's a strong word. Listen, listen, a nation being like a drop in a bucket is a strong word. Right. Being less than nothing is a strong word. Being less than nothing in vanity, those are strong concepts coming from God. Be like unto spittle. Be like spit? Because this is how we're taught the Bible. Nobody teaches the Bible this way. But when, if you read into the scriptures and look at the reality of things, this is how the Most High feels. So the question is this. Is God unrighteous? Is God unfair? Is God unfair for choosing favorites? Because that's, that's what we're saying. We're saying that God has favorites. We're saying that God likes one set of people over another. And that's according to the Bible. And that's according to the Bible. Um, let's read on. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with the Most High? God forbid. God says no. I'm not. Listen, there's no unrighteousness in that. God had a favorite. Read on. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. God. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Hold this. Matter of fact, let's do this. Let's go to 2nd Ezra chapter 5, verse 22. We're going to get back to this. <laughs> Promise. But I want to go over this. This is the time to pull this verse. 2nd Ezra chapter 5, verse 22 to 27. Se Read on. Second Ezra chapter 5, verse 22 to 27. And my spirit recovered the spirit of understanding. And I began to talk with the Most High again. Okay, so this is Esther is talking to God, the Most High. Read on. And said, O Lord, that bearest rule of every wood of the earth and of all the trees thereof, thou hast chosen the only one vine. He says, what we're going to start reading is that God had favorites. God had a favorite tree, 
a favorite vine. Read on. And of all the lands of the whole world, Thou hast chosen thee one pit. Out of all, he says, out of all the lands of the world, thou hast chosen thee one pit. That one pit is Israel. Okay? You're going to read that all throughout the scriptures, he had favorites. He had favorites. And that pit's Jerusalem. But he had favorites. He had favorite lands. He had favorite trees. Read on. And of all the flowers thereof, <laughs> one lily. He said he had, the most high's favorite flower is a lily. So once again, we shouldn't be surprised that God picks favorites. Because people are flabbergasted that God would choose Jacob, which ends up being the Israelites, the so-called black man, and he'd hate the so-called white man. Or you look at the rest of the nations as insignificant. Because that's how he looks at it. The nations are insignificant. The so-called white man is hated. And God chose the so-called Negroes, West Indians, Central Americans, South Americans, the Caribbean Islands, and the so-called Mexicans. That doesn't make sense to a a layman that doesn't understand God. But if you understand God, he tells you he has favorites. He has a favorite plant. A favorite flower, I mean, which is a lily. Favorite pit, Jerusalem. Read on. And of all the depths of the sea, thou hast filled thee one river. That's the river Jordan. No, yeah, the river Jordan. Read on. Mm -hmm. And of all the builded cities, thou hast hollowed Zion unto thyself. Exactly. So that pit is Israel, and Zion, which is Jerusalem, is his. Read on. And of all the fowls that are created... Thou hast named thee one dove. One dove. Read on. And of all the cattle that are made, thou hast provided thee one sheep. So he's showing you that God prefers the sheep. There's a bunch of other animals out there. Right. A bunch of other cattle out there. There's there's there's, there's goat. There's damn um, rams. Rams. There's there's there's, there's um, cows. Oxen. You name it. There's a bunch. But he has a favorite. God has favorites. But it's never taught. We've never learned that in the world. But God has favorites. He has a favorite nation too. Read on. And among all the multitude of peoples, thou hast gotten thee one people. And unto this people whom thou lovest, thou gavest a law that is approved of all. So he says he loved one people and he gave that one people that he loved a law. That was the Israelites. So we shouldn't look at the Most High as being unrighteous. Now we're starting to understand the Most High. We're understanding how the Most High is. Man, he has favorites. He loves this. He loves that. Just because he created it doesn't mean he loves it. And that's a tough pill to swallow if you're not an Israelite. I get it. But it doesn't make it wrong. It doesn't make it untrue. Okay. Right. Did you want to Did you want to show where only Israel was given that law? Psalms 147? Let's do it. Psalms chapter 147 verse 19 and 20. He showed his word unto Jacob. His statutes and his judgments unto Israel. So the statutes and the the statutes of the laws, the judgments are the punishments for not following the law. That was all given to Israel. Read on. He hath not dealt so with any nation. He hasn't given the law or the punishment of the law to anybody else but the Israelites. Read on. And as for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise ye the Lord. And that's how you know it's love. He said the Most High loved Israel because he gave them the laws, statutes, and commandments. That's because in the laws, statutes, and commandments were intended to set us apart from the rest of the world. Right. Was to, to get us that tier above everyone else. It would, it would raise up uh, ethics in our nation. It would raise up our morality. It would raise up our equity, our fairness, our righteousness, our charity to one, to one another. Mm -hmm. How we operate, our mode of operations, how we do things. It would, actually, it would actually initiate a better, stronger culture than everybody else in the world. It would, it, would, it would show what harmony looks like, what unity looks like, what love looks like. We were made to manifest the love of the Most High in the world, but through, the, through us, the children of Israel, as being that, that vessel that the Most High was using to put his word on display, to put his, his laws and commandments on display so the rest of the world could see this is how you're supposed to operate as a child of God. Okay, so let's go hit Romans 9 and 14 again. I think it was important that we went there to show that, hey, God has favorites. So we can't function and look at the most high or the teachers who are teaching today like we're coming off with some unrighteous concepts. God isn't unrighteous for having favorites, for having chosen one nation over another. Read right. on. We have favorites, you know. Con. Read on. We're in um, 15, verse 15. 15. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, 
And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So what he's saying is, hey, man, the Most High is going to love who he's going to love. He's going to be compassion with who he's going to have compassion with. He's going to be patient with who he's going to be patient with. He's going to not care about people that he's not going to care about. It just is what it is. Read on. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of the Most High that showeth mercy. And that's the point. It's not about what one person is or is not doing. It's just God's will. It's his choice. It's his choice. And we have to accept and honor God's choice. If you're an Israelite, you should just be appreciative that you're an Israelite. And we should be smart enough not to be contented with the Father about, well, if, if, if God doesn't accept everybody, then I don't want to be a part of God. I've literally heard that statement, yep. which is ridiculous. Just be appreciative the most I chose you in the first place. Read on. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will, he harden it. So what he's saying in verse 17 is, hey, even the Most High at times will, 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 will lift up a nation. He'll lift up a nation like Egypt, because they were the world dominant power for a significant period of time. And in the process of that nation being uplifted, he allowed them to be powerful to show the world how powerful he was when he broke them down and brought the Israelites out. And the Most High in the Scripture, when you read Revelations and other parts of the Bible, the Most High compares present-day America to Egypt and Babylon. Because those were the two major places of our captivities. And the reason the Most High brings up these nations is for him to show his power to the entire world. Can you imagine the Most High delivering us out of this place now? And the magnitude and the fear and respect that will come from the entire world when, when, when the world sees the Most High come out and pull his Israelites out of this place to bring them back to their homeland. So he's showing you he'll even uplift nations just to smash them to show the whole world that it was always about Israel in the first place. He did it before. He'll do it again. Either way, he's going to bring up who he wants to bring up, lift up who he's going to lift up, and it doesn't matter what we think. It's his will. Read on. Verse 19. Thou would say then unto me, why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? And he's saying, listen, so if everybody's playing their part, why is he going to be finding fault with the so-called white men of the nations? Why would he be upset with the nations if they're doing what he's supposed to do, what they're supposed to do? Read on. Nay, but O oh man. Who art thou that replies against the Most High? So once again, why are we taking the position of trying to challenge the Most High's thinking? Even today, our job is just to paint the picture of how the Father looks at things. It's not up to me to, to challenge or to, or to contend with God's will. This is about teaching and elaborating about what His will is. None of us have the right to contend or to argue or to complain as to why the Most High does things the way He does. Read on. Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? And that's the point. We don't have the right to complain to the one that made us, why did you make me this way? This is similar to what we read in Ecclesiastes 33. Mm -hmm. Read on. Had not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? And that's what we have to accept. God made one vessel. Remember you read it on Esther, or Esther chapter 10 and 10? He said the Most High made two lots, one lot for Israel, one lot for the Gentiles, right? This is what the scripture is saying. He said this, he made one vessel unto honor. The Israelites were made to be honorable. The nations were made to be dishonorable. That was just God's intention. It was God's plan. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, you know, I want to just uh, elaborate on this. He says in verse 21, he said, had not the potter power over the clay... Of the same lump, talking about that lump of Adam. We all come from Adam. He says, to make one vessel unto honor, but we look at the descendants of Adam and the chosen coming from Abraham, Isaac, to Jacob. He says, and another unto dishonor. Mm -hmm. Showing you that even though all nations come from Adam and, uh, and are made of the same clay, the Most High doesn't have the same feelings. So now we're going to show you what the Most High, real quick, in one verse, what that particular clay is that he's talking about when he talks about the potter having power over the clay. This is in uh, Jeremiah chapter 18, Got it. verse 6. Okay. He said, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. So the Most High is showing you that of, out of the same clay of Adam, he was creating a particular nation that he was going to be molding. 
Because that's what you do with clay. Yep. You fashion clay. You mold clay. You shape clay. And you get to choose what kind of pot, what kind of vessel, what kind of shape, uh, what kind of size. What kind of caliber. Caliber, quality. You get to choose what you want to create. So it's up to the Most High to make the, the people of honor, which is the children of Israel, and it's up to the Most High to make the people of dishonor. It's still the Most High's choice, and we can't deny or contradict the doings of the Most High. Con, um, I want to go also, before we continue, I want to go to those other verses in Ecclesiastes 17, verse 17 and 18. We had missed it earlier. I had missed it earlier, but I want to make sure we get this verse because it's very important. Ecclesiastes in the Apocrypha, chapter 17, verse 17 and 18. Ecclesiastes, chapter 17, verse 17. For in the division of the nations of the whole earth, he set a ruler over every people. He said when the Most High divided the entire nations, because once again, that is the theme. He has been dividing and separating from the beginning. He said every nation was given a king. Okay, read on. He says, but Israel is the Lord's portion. He says Israel was the Lord's portion. Israel wasn't supposed to have a king. And when you read in Samuel, that's why the Mosai was so upset about Israel wanting a king and fighting for a king. Because before Saul, the Most High was the one that looked after us. Mm -hmm. He took care of us. He sat back here and worked through us. We, but we got jealous, saw the nations with their kings, and wanted to do what they did. But God, listen, man. I wanted the nations. I wanted. I wanted the nations to govern themselves. I, the intention from the entire world was for man to govern man, and I govern you. This is how we understand that it was. We were never supposed to be on the same level as the nations. Electing a ruler over us. He said, "Listen, I don't want people to be over you. I'm over you." I listen. Don't. I, he couldn't see how man couldn't see that as an advantage. That you had a direct link to the Most High. And everybody else had to be subject to man's will. But we, like idiots, wanted to be like the nations, so we got Saul. The biggest, strongest of us all, who had no spirit nor love to the Most High. So once again, he's showing us from the beginning, it was always supposed to be the Most High directly working with us. Read on. Verse uh, 18. 18. Whom being his firstborn... He nourished it with discipline. The intention, the development, and that pot, that molding that you were talking about was through discipline. The development was through discipline and instruction. That's how he molded us to be better. Read on. And giving him the light of his love doth not forsake him. So he, the purpose was to give us this law, to give us this instruction, to make us a better caliber to the world. And when you read in Matthew 5, it talks about us being that light to the world, that city on a hill. That was the intention when the Most High made us and separated us. Okay, so now let's go from there. We're going to go down to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1 through 10. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1 and 10. This chapter starts going into, once again, how the Most High feels about the nations. And the crazy thing, when you read it here, Deuteronomy, it talks about how the Most High was going to give us that land of milk and honey. Mm -hmm. And we talk about that, but we don't always realize that, hey, man, that land was already inhabited. Right. It was already inhabited with people, human beings. Right. Other nations. Other other nations. And he shows you, most I didn't have any value. He said, listen, man, I'll bring you in there. I'm going to take them out. Mm -hmm. They're about to go. <laughs> they will get murked. <laughs> go in there. Kill them all. This is yours. He's showing you how little of regard he had for the nations in this chapter. Read that. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 1. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. Stop. Seven and one is saying, I want you to cast out. I'm casting out all these ites. Amorites, Girgashites, Hittites, Canaanites, Parasites. We don't think about They're little babies here. Right. Old they're, folks. They're old folks. There's the elderly. They're young people. They're women. They're children. children. There's a lot of there's a lot of life here, man. Right. It's a lot of human it's a lot of human beings, it, man. It, it was a culture already in existence. Okay, we, we talking about we talking about just babies, man. Right. What about the babies? You got babies, you got children, you got old people. They're singing and dancing in their land, they're eating. 
What are they doing? They're doing what do they do? <laughs> they didn't deserve this. They, they, they chilled at the house. And the most I listen, man, go take them out, man. It's yours. Take it. Right. He says, take their, just take the houses. Just go in the, kill them all and go in the house and chill. Take their cribs and, and live. Everything's going to be okay. He's trying to show you, man, listen, he really didn't give two you-know-whats about these people. And this is how, when we're reading the Bible, I don't see why people can't look at things this way. Right. It's not very difficult. Not my God. It's not my God. Listen. Right. These guys were living their culture, doing their thing, playing little banjos and little, little dang Hamite songs, little African songs. Oh, la, 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 la. They're doing their thing, yeah. man. They're doing their African thing, living their life. And all of a sudden, God, listen, man, get your swords and take them out. I want you to do it. And then God, when you read about it, got mad because we didn't take them all out. He said, why'd you stop killing them? He said, why'd you stop? You look at the maps about the Israelites. We stopped killing the Africans. And the most I got mad that we stopped killing them. That's why down the line, the Philistines end up giving us problems. Which is another African nation. We were oh, supposed yeah. to take them all out. He went, listen, God said, okay, Israelites, I want you to kill all these people in your land. And it's going to be all right. I want you to do it. He said, wipe them all out. Don't spare anybody. Read on. We'll read it. We'll read it. Verse 2. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. God wants you, wanted us to take them out. An entire nation. Little, little babies, man. Little babies, little kids, families. Little you boys spend, and girls. They didn't want it to happen. They were scared. It was crying out of tears and crying. Like, Listen, man, I don't care about all that. They're like a drop in a bucket. They're, ins they're vain. They're, it's, they're insignificant. Just do away with them. Read on. Thou shalt make no covenant with them. It says, nor show mercy unto them. I don't want you to show mercy. I don't want you to all join hands together. I don't want you to be a part of anything. He says, you can take the bin. Just don't take their gods. Don't take their little Babylonian garments. Right. Don't take that. Just take their kingdom. I don't, want, I don't want you to take any of their culture with you. But take, take the houses. Take the gold. Take the bread. Get them out. Read on. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. So he made it clear his, his belief system. I don't want you intermingling. Yep. I don't care how pretty she looks. It don't matter. I don't care if she smiled at you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if she smiled. I don't want you to be a part of them. I want you separate, and, and, and to show you how serious I am about you being separate, I want you to wipe them all out. Read on. Verse 4. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. He's showing you he understood why he wanted everybody wiped out. Because he understood Israel were like what? That's what the most saying in Matthew calls Israel the lost what? Lost sheep. Lost sheep. Because it's easy, we're easily influenced. And he understood that about us. Which is why he kept us close. He said, man, Israel is influenceable. They'll sit back here and see these nations and want to be down with them. Right. Then I'll spoil my creation. And i got to whip their butts again and put them back into slavery. I want you to kill them all. He says, I want you to have good things, Israel. But you got to do what I'm asking you to do. And you got to take out this nation. He's showing you where his heart was. God's heart was only to deal with our people. He could care less about these Jebusites and these Hivites and all these Amorites and all these ites. He didn't care. And, and that's something that we should actually try to let sink in. God doesn't care about certain people. That's a tough pill to swallow, but it's the truth. It's the truth. What did these guys do? What these, oh, la, la, la. They're just jamming, man. They're living yeah. their life. They're breaking the law, living their life. And God said, man, I want them out, man. I don't want them. I want them out that spot. Get them out of this spot. I don't want them there. It's that simple. It was like a little chess piece. Take them out. Read on. Verse 5. But thus shall that but thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars, and break down their images, and cut down their groves. And burn their graven images with fire. So we said, I don't want you to associate with their culture at all. Right. This is their culture. Eliminate their culture. 
You're taking their land. Do not hold on to their culture. So once again, does God want us to intermingle cultures? No. He never intended us to intermingle cultures and, 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 and let me learn about what you do and you can learn about what I do. We can, we can join information. No. He said, man, let them do that. Let the nations tap into each other's zone. You are mine. You are set aside. I'll give you the world, but stay next to me. Read on. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. And this is why the most says that the nations are vain. They're, they're vanity. They're less than nothing. Because in a spiritual format, in a spiritual world, the Most High can't use them. Mm -hmm. The Most High can't use them spiritually, which is why the Most High intended for us to be dealt with spiritually. That's what the holy people meant. We were supposed to function and operate on a spiritual level. Read on. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself. Above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Now you can see that physically and athletically our people are superior in multiple things. Right. But I'm not, I'm not here to focus on I can jump higher, we can jump higher, we can run faster. We know that. We come with the Jesse Owens and, the, and, and, and all the exploits our people have done athletically with basketball and all that stuff. That's not the point. What makes us special, what makes us chosen was the fact that we were able to connect to the most high. That's yeah. why right now I can shoot a hoop, dunk a basketball, run a 4-2, and still be low level. Right. Because I'm what, what makes me high level, what makes me a high caliber inf uh, individual, is my ability to apply this Bible the correct way. To serve the most high in an optimal fashion. That's what why I was intended or why we were intended to be a holy, special nation above everybody else. Because I've seen some hammers that are pretty damn fast too. Right. I've seen some fast white guys. I've seen some fast um, um, Asians, African people, Asians. Asians. Hey, um, just this last week in the high school um, state championships in, 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 the run, in the 100 yard dash, white boy beat everybody. Straight up. One year running track, he beat everybody at state. All the fastest brothers in damn Texas got beat. Straight up. And the 400 and the 100. So they got some fast people too. So if we're going to equate being this holy chosen generation just off feats of athleticism, we're missing the boat. What makes us special is our ability to connect to the Most High in these scriptures. And commit ourselves to the Lord in these scriptures. That's what makes us great. That's what we're supposed to make us special and chosen in God's eyes. Let's read on. He said, The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. We were intended to be above. What the Most High is showing us that once again, we were made to be superior. We were not, it wasn't a question about equality. Yeah. And it definitely wasn't about inferiority. This is about the most, I said, without a doubt, if we tapped into our spiritual potential, we were above the rest of the nations. We were above the world if we tapped into who we were supposed to be and if we accepted the role God had intended for us to play. Don't forget in Romans 7 or Romans 9, we were supposed to play a role. We were supposed to play the role or that vessel of honor. And if we play that vessel of honor, we are above the rest of the world. That makes us special, playing our role. But for them, off and on, since Genesis, we hated playing the role of the, of the honorable people. Mm -hmm. We want to play the bad guy. Right. We want to wear the black cap. Versus, no, we were supposed to be the hero. We were supposed to be the good person. <coughs> Read on. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people. For ye were the fewest of all people. He so it wasn't like it was about strength and numbers, and I had I picked the largest, strongest group of people. That's not the case. Right. Read on. But because the Lord loved you, and because He would keep the oath which He had sworn unto your fathers, it was just about election. What makes us special? We were fortunate enough for God to choose us. Now, if we were chosen, live up to why you were chosen. Stop playing this game, trying to fit into the world, and be somebody that you're not. Read on. Hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bond, bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of, king of Egypt? And that's the crazy. The, the crazy thing is that he, may, he took us out of slavery. 
But he also tells us in Jeremiah 2 and 14, is Israel a home-born slave? It's like we crave to be low level. All God keeps doing is trying to get us to be in function at a higher level, spiritually. And we want to keep functioning like niggas. Excuse my French. Like servants. Like low-level base individuals. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. We don't want to read. We don't want to study. We don't want to apply ourselves in the scriptures. We want all this good thing to happen. We want to sing and dance and shuck and jive and hope the Most High just blesses us. Versus accepting who we were meant to be. Read on. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him, and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. So he's saying, Mosiah is keeping up his end of the deal. The only person not keeping up his end of the deal is us. He's like, man, I'm going to keep this covenant for thousand generations. <clears throat> I'm not going away and I'm not changing. I chose you. I'm going to ride with you. I'm not leaving without you. But I'm going to correct you because you ain't listening. And I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait it out. Don't forget, the Most High waited an entire generation of Israel out. Because they just didn't want to believe in the, in the wilderness. Right. Out of an entire generation of people, that's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people, he let two people in? Yep. What is he showing you? I'll wait, I'll wait you out. If, if y'all got to die, you got to die. I'll wait till the next generation comes in. Yep. Maybe they'll figure it out. Maybe y'all get tired of getting your butts kicked and you'll come back to the realization of who you are. Or fighting for equality. Exactly. Maybe one day you realize it ain't about equality. We were meant to be superior if we open up the damn Bible and read and apply it. Read on. He says, and repay them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hated him. He will repay him to his face. So he's showing you, listen, man. I will repay the nations that hated you. I will repay anybody that hated me. Just do your job. Do your job, lock in, and I'll be there for you. I'll take care of you. I'll even avenge you. Okay, let that go. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 2, and then verse 3. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 2 and 3. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people Unto himself, above all the nations that are upon the earth. One thing we were chosen. To, I love the word peculiar. We were right. chosen to be peculiar. And a lot of times, when when I was when I came up, it was always about the feats of athleticism, intelligence, strength, all this good stuff. You know, the crazy thing about it is, we might have had great people that have come through our nation, great intelligence people, great intelligence inventors, mathematicians, mm -hmm. athletes, so forth and so on. We have a lot of a lot of people that are average brothers and sisters too. So we we're not this dynamic nation of all geniuses and all exceptional type A personalities. That's not us. So let's not act like that's why we're peculiar. We're peculiar because of what verse 3 down says. Read on. Verse 3. Thou shalt not eat any abominable thing. So as you read down from three on down, he gives you dietary laws. He's telling you you're peculiar if you follow the laws. But if we're eating catfish and shrimp by the lobster, guess what? We're not peculiar anymore. Now we're just some regular base, base ass people that don't have an idea of how to serve the most high. So our peculiarness is about our willingness to serve God and follow his laws, statutes, and commandments. That's what makes us special. If we don't follow God's laws, we ain't special. We're just some random dudes trying to act like we're on some level. Oh, what's up, God? What's up, King? What's up, Prince? We ain't no Prince. If we don't want to follow the word of the Most High, we're just some low-level people. Okay. Let that go. Go to Psalms 135 and 4. Psalms, chapter 135, verse 4. Mm -hmm. For the Lord had chosen Jacob unto himself, and Israel for his peculiar treasure. That's that peculiar word again. The most I made is that peculiar treasure. Listen, we are special. We are dynamic. If we read the Bible, can we just read the Bible, Israel? Can we sit back here and read that this was all for us? Can we accept that God doesn't love the entire world and that he chose us and he wants us to play the honorable role because the rest of the world was meant to be dishonorable? Why can't we accept that? 
The Mosiah said in Leviticus 25 and 55 that Israel was supposed to be his servants. We were created to serve him. Mm. We were created to minister unto him. That was what our calling was. We got to accept that. We have to own that if we want to be empowered and if we want to be peculiar. We can't be peculiar be talking about um, Islam, trying right. to be a five percenter. You're just a regular African then, bro. You're a regular Hamite, regular Arab, if that's what you're pushing. Our power and our strength is the most high. Let that go. And let's go to Psalms 105, verse 6 and 10. Psalms chapter 105, verse 6 and 10. Psalms chapter 105, verse 6. O seed of Abraham, his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen. Verse 10. No, it's through 10. Oh, through 10. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. So once again, the Most High is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Read on. He hath remembered his covenant forever. He always is going to remember his covenant. I don't care if it's the New Testament or the Old Testament. The covenant was with the Israelites. The only difference is Israelites, once we went through the numerous captivities, were sent, were shipped and sent to all the four corners of the earth, and it got to them. We didn't know who we were, so we right. thought of ourselves as Gentiles. So when we get in this New Testament, the only Gentiles the Most High is dealing with is these Israelites who were scattered from who they were originally, which were Israelites. Read on. The word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac. And confirm the same unto Jacob for a law and to Israel for an everlasting covenant. So once again, this covenant with us was everlasting. And all the conditions that we had to live to live up to our end of the covenant was to follow his laws and do his will. That's all we have to do. And it's like it's like a dang Chinese riddle, man. We can't just just get to understanding what our purpose is and just stick to it. You know why? Because soon as basketball season ends, <laughs> football season starts. <laughs> and, and, and then after the game, you gotta go to the club. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then it's two dollar Tuesdays. <laughs> it's the you know? truth. So we we get caught up, man. We get, and we get distracted. And that and that distraction, if it's not just entertainment or Game of Thrones or the next you know uh, hit show. It's I gotta go. I gotta get two jobs to maintain my responsibilities and my bills. Yes. Then I'm distracted with just trying to survive. Yep. And that becomes a, a whole nother obstacle and withdraws us from our original purpose as well. So Just true. surviving alone. Okay. Let's get um Exodus four and twenty two. Exodus chapter four verse twenty two. Mm hmm. Exodus chapter four verse twenty two. Mm hmm. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh. Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Once again, we've been kind of beating the dead horse here, but Israel is the Most High's firstborn son. And that firstborn son is heir to what? The kingdom, all the gifts, all of the, all of the power. The inheritance. The inheritance goes to the firstborn son. That's just how it is. Right, and, and it's all, and, and according to the law, if say if you have a man has three children, the firstborn, the, the, the inheritance gets divided in four parts. And the firstborn gets two parts, and then the other other children get the uh one third and uh or one quarter and one quarter. So the firstborn has uh the, the dominant portion that belongs to the father and the father's inheritance. So the most high when he looks at Israel, he sees Israel as his firstborn, meaning they get a side of him that the other nations don't get. They get to see a side of the Most High that He doesn't show the rest of the rest of the nations. They he, they he, they get a side of understanding. They get His mercy. They get His compassion, and they get things that the other nations aren't privy to because they are considered the firstborn. And with the firstborn comes firstborn privileges, and that's one advantage that we have as being the firstborn of Israel or firstborn of the Most High. We belong to Him, and we get all the extra goodies. All we gotta do is be obedient. That's it. And as far as the nations, let's go to Genesis 2 and 14. Genesis chapter 2, verse 14. I can read this. Genesis 2 and 14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, mm -hmm. do by nature the things contained in the law. Oh, Romans. Romans uh, 2 and 14. What did I say? Genesis. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Romans That's 2 right. and 14. We that was it. my bad. Romans 2 and 14. 
For when the Gentiles, which have not the law... Because you know what? Even though the nations don't necessarily have the law, and the law was not given to them, even though the Bible was translated in all languages, the intention was still for the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. But when the Gentiles do things like they ha they give charity, they take care of their families, feed they, the look, poor. they feed the poor, they look out for one another, they donate. Mm -hmm. He says when they do things that are similar to what the law talks about, as far as the love that, that's in the law, go ahead. Do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law. He said not having the law because the law was never given to them but unto the seed of Jacob. Go ahead. Are a law unto themselves. So it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't build any credit or you don't get yes. any awards or sponsorship from the Most High because you did good deeds. Mm -hmm. If you get if you did good deeds, then the person that you did the good deed to will benefit from that. But it doesn't get you any closer to the Father. Exactly. The nations were they gonna do what they're gonna do, good, bad, or indifferent. They don't have any stake in the game. The Most High saying, "I'm the one. I'm critical of you." That's just like if I have a kid. And somebody else's kid is acting a fool over there, or are the kids good over there? It doesn't matter to me. I'm responsible for my children. And that's how the Most High deals with the nations. Mm -hmm. Even though that was the Most High's creation, he created the entire world. He's only responsible for the ones he claimed. And he claimed us through that covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we can't run from it. We can't escape his discipline. When we read in Ecclesiastes 17, read it earlier, he said he nourished us with discipline. And the problem is... We don't accept his discipline. That's why we keep getting stung. Okay, let that go. <clears throat> go to um, Isaiah 41, verse 8 and 9. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 8 and verse 9. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Read on. Thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth, and called thee from the chief men thereof, and said unto thee, Thou art my servant. I have chosen thee, and and not cast thee away. So once again, he's chosen us. Listen, we've gone from Genesis, we're flipping from Isaiah, Jeremiah, um, the Apocrypha. We keep bouncing to show that, hey, the Most High has never done away with us. And he chose us. I mean, we have more verses which we will go through. But I think the point is driven. Who God chose who this Bible was written for, who it was intended for. And not every man is equal <clears throat> in the sight of the Most High. Not every man is equal in sight of the Most High. The Most High chose one nation of people above the rest of the world. Okay, now let's, um, let's hit Psalms 33, verse 12. I'm going to start rolling through this. Psalms chapter 33, verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen... For his own inheritance. I guess we're, I guess we're blessed. Because we're the yeah. ones he, that, we, that were given the inheritance. We're the ones that were chosen. Okay, to be his people. Let that go. And go to Jeremiah 31 and 9. Jeremiah 31 and 9. Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 9. They shall come with weeping and with supplications will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of water to a straight way, in a straight way, where, wherein they shall not stumble. For I am the father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. I am a father to Israel. He's showing us who he's focusing on. The Most High is a father to us. No one else. It's, it's like this entire Bible is a love letter, and the Most High is constantly trying to get our attention, and he's pleading with us, and he's begging with us to get right. And he's been constantly um, putting us in captivity for the sake of waking us up so we can come to the realization of why are, we go why are we catching so much hell? Why are we going through so many captivities? Why are we going through slavery? Because the Most High is trying to get our attention. And he's trying to get us to resort back to the Bible to get understanding, to, sh to show that this is happening to us because we're the ones who broke the covenant. Mm -hmm. We're the ones who... Uh, uh, violated the initial agreement that was set with our forefathers, and this is why we're receiving generational curses. Huh. So now we're going to focus on the last part of the class, which is dealing with now that we understand that we're chosen, we understand that God only chose one particular people, but as a, as a nation, we have not fulfilled expectations. As a nation, we have not honored our end of the bargain. So, what is it that we have to do? 
to get back into power. If we were chosen, mm -hmm. we were chosen to be this great nation, this special people, this peculiar treasure, all this good stuff. What is it got? What we have to do to actually get and to fulfill our destiny? Because you know, there's a lot of works out there that people do as far as trying to raise the community, mm -hmm. building community centers, building gyms, uh, donation locations. Yep. There's a lot of our people <laughs> that have committed a lifestyle and a lifelong fight for civil rights, equal rights. Uh, uh, just hum humanity rights, mm -hmm. hu human rights. I mean, our people have gone through great lengths of dedicating themselves to black studies, black hi agricultural yep. study, history, culture, yes. uh, history and cultural studies. We've done a lot of works and efforts to resurrect our people, but we we still come short when you look at how the world is su so much of an advantage than we are. And while even though we fight the hardest, we're still subjugated to prison systems. We're still subjugated to jails. We're still on the lowest totem pole when it comes to economics. We're still at the bottom of the totem pole when it comes to uh, uh, wealth and, and uh, um, stability in households. We still dominate in the worst uh, stats when it comes to health, uh, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, strokes, HIV. But when you look at why are we still at the bottom? Mm -hmm. If the Most High is intended us. intended us that we be chosen, we have now we have to go and ask that question. And what and what will it take to elevate us amidst all the fights that we have been going uh, uh, dealing with so far in America? So let's go back to Second Ezra chapter six and fifty nine. Earlier in the class, we we glanced over it. I didn't want to focus too much of it because we're going to focus back at it now. So let's go to Second Ezra six and fifty nine, and kind of go into. Uh, what this verse is talking about. Read that. <clears throat> Second Ezra chapter 6, verse 59. If the world now be made for our sakes. Once again, we, uh, we understand that. Mm -hmm. I think we've read that enough to understand the world was made for our sake. The, the, the glory of this world was made for us, our, our sake. Okay, read on. Why do we not possess an inheritance with the world? Why do we not possess an inheritance? Why are we on the bottom of the totem pole? Why we look down upon as a nation? Why is why is the, our best intentions never really manifest into really great works? Read on. He says, how long shall this endure? So the question is, why don't we possess the inheritance? And how long are we going to be suffering without this inheritance? So the first verse we want to go into is Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 19, and then verse 18. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 19. And it shall come to pass. When ye shall say, Wherefore doth the Lord our God all these things unto us? So why is it? Because he says, Therefore you're going to say, Why is the Most High kicking our tails? Why are we going through all these things that we're going through? Why are we losing so much? Why are we suffering so much? Read on. Then thou shalt answer them, Like as, as ye have forsaken me, and served strange gods in your land, so shall ye serve strangers in a land that is not yours. So he's saying, Listen, we wanted to serve strange gods in our own land. Now, the punishment is to serve strange gods in another person's land, another kingdom's land. So we're showing you we might have good intentions. We might want to right. help our people. We might do, build the community centers. We might want to do mentorship programs. We might want to uh, uh, promote black business. But that's only part of the equation. We got to stop serving strange gods. We have to get back to serving the Most High the right way. On top of trying to unite, do good to each other, take care of one another. It is a combination of both. I have to want to sit back here and please the Heavenly Father the way He wants to be pleased, not the way I want to please Him. That's the rule number one. Stop serving these strange gods. Stop following these, these opposite ways of living. Stop trying to fit into this place, this country. Separate ourselves from this place's ways. And get back to our power source, the laws, the statutes, the commandments, the understanding of who you are. That's what it's going to take. Read on. And uh, you want uh, 18. verse 18. Nevertheless, in those days, said the Lord, I will not make a full end with you. So what he's saying is even though we've been messing up, even though we've been serving strange gods and we've been, we've been constantly, habitually, generation from generation, have been going opposite of pleasing God, he's not going to do away with us completely. He's going to give us an opportunity to make it right. And these generations in front of us, we need to make it right. We need to stop wasting so much time and get back to serving the Creator the way He wants to be served. Let that go and go to Romans chapter 10 and verse 19. Because it's also trying to understand why are we punished? Why are we catching this kind of hell? 
why are we still not getting the fruits of success? Okay. Romans you know. chapter 10, verse 19. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy by, to, by them that are no people. He's telling us that the, the reason the Most High has us at the bottom is not so that we can sit back here and fight for equal rights. It's not that we sit back here and stop fighting to be second class citizens. The purpose of us being brought low is for us to understand we were supposed to be provoked to jealousy. Yes, we were intended to serve the God most high and be powerful. We were intended to be great. Unfortunately, because of our conduct, because of our lack of willingness to serve him, we went against him. So us, our captivity in America, our prior captivities in Rome, Greece, Babylon, Persian, and Median Empire, all these punishments were to sit back here and make us jealous. The intention of these situations and these circumstances were to sit back and get us to want to go back to the Most High. What we do, though, we see the problems that we're in, and we're trying to fix our problems through the government. We're trying to march. We're trying to protest. We're trying to fight for rights. But the purpose was to get us to understand that, hey, man, I'm just making you jealous. You can come back to me. I'll take you out of the conditions. You got to come to me. Right. And then our people get upset because we we don't understand and we try as hard as we can to try to get the other nations to have mercy on us. And mm -hmm. yet they don't. Or we try to hit the nations with a guilty complex. Yep. You know what? They're not going to feel guilty for them being a in a position of power because the most high put them in that position of power to, to, to make us jealous to say this is what you could have if you were obedient. Exactly. So the nations this is why you're, no matter what we do. Lay on the ground, put your hands up, put your hands down, get step out the car, step in the car, show your ID. We're never going to be able to show them through no matter no matter what kind of chart, graph, statistic. We're not going to make them feel guilty because the Most High put them in that position to make us feel jealous, so to what, envy that that freedom and that liberty. So the power we should we should be exerting our energy back to serving the Most High, not yelling and arguing and cursing about the white man. Because right. the funny thing is, it's not about the he's playing his part. He's doing what he's supposed to do. Right. These cops, was, uh, they're supposed to be beating on black people. That's what they do. That's what happens when you're in captivity. That's what you, when you, when you, when you're in captivity, you're getting beat up and taken out. They're following their part. We're not doing our job. And our job isn't to march and argue and get police chiefs fired and sit back here and, and, and uproot and oust political officials. That's not going to solve anything because the next political official will do the same thing they did. Like we sit back here and say, oh man, we got Obama in office. Everything's going to change. Ain't a damn thing changed. Right. We got to get Trump out of the office. You know what? Trump doing what damn Obama did. He is more brash about it. Right. There's no president going to change our situation. Or feel guilty. There's no elected official that's going to give a crap about our people. The only person that gives a crap about us from the beginning was the Most High. And we keep spitting at him. We'll sit back here and vote and shuck and jive for this guy or that guy. But we won't vote for the Most High. We won't sit back here and, 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 and submit our life to him. Because that's what he's asking. Submit to me and I'll take care of all the rest. Mm -hmm. We don't do that. That's the answer though. We tried every other method. And it don't work. You know, if, if, if a leader gets too big, he gets, he gets shot. He gets wiped out. And then what happens? All, all, the, all, the, all the hubbub kind of goes down. We might riot. Right. Tear up our own neighborhood. Nothing changes. If we want to get out of this circle jerk of, of hell and, 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 and everything we go through, we got to go back in this Bible. Right. That's what has to happen. So once again, he's showing us we're in our situation and predicament to make us jealous. That was the goal. Not to sit back here and argue with the white men about more rights. We were supposed to say, okay, man, this guy's in power. Let me get back to the most high and serve him so we can get out of this crap. Yep. That's what it was supposed to be. And when you read about the book of Judges, all it took was all Israel to come to the Most High and cry out for help. And he'd come through. And he'd send a judge and pull us out. But we have to come together as a nation and cry out to the Heavenly Father and do things the right way. And he'd come deliver us. But that's too much like right. Right. Now let that go and go to Jeremiah 46 and 28.
Jeremiah chapter 46, verse 28. Fear thou not, O Jacob, my servant, saith the Lord, for I am with thee, for I will make in I will make a full end of all the nations whither I have driven thee. He's showing us that his will is to wipe out these nations that he has over us. He will make a full end of the nations that whither I have driven thee. Read on. But I will not make a full end of thee, but correct thee in measure. He corrects us in measure. That means depending on how delinquent or negative the, the offense is, the punishment is equal to that. Mm -hmm. So that lets us know we were doing some real wickedness to get put in captivity again. For 400 years. 400 years. That meant the punishment fit the crime. That means we did some serious offenses towards the Heavenly Father to be in the conditions that we're in. Mm -hmm. And that's the first thing we got to think about. Stop looking at the white man as the scapegoat and look at yourself. Look at our people. Look at our people's rebellious history. Because mm -hmm. that's the solution. Stop being rebellious as a nation and we'll get out of it. Right, because the, obviously it shows that they don't even have an answer for our poverty and our situation. They gave us ghettos as the solution to uh, uh, housing, uh, 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 Section 8 housing, food stamps, welfare. They don't really have an answer. They don't want it. It's not up to them to <laughs> provide the solution. Right. Why do they got to solve it? Right. Listen, they're benefiting from it. Why would they have to fix it? All they want is your, the, the, the seven-foot black dude that can dunk a ball. They'll take him out the hood. <laughs> they'll take him the yeah. four two. They'll take him out. He's they can make money. He's marketing. He's I can marketing. make money off right. this guy. Everybody else, do you. I need that man for the gladiator show. Yeah. I want him. Bring him forth. That's what this is. <laughs> Other than that, listen, we got to get ourselves out of this issue by serving the most high. It sounds religious. But when you read all throughout the Bible, the most high is waiting for us to figure it out. We're going through every other source to, to get a solution but him. I'm not talking about just praying. It's changing your lifestyle. Making significant changes in your conduct. That's how you get the most high's attention. So, um, read that. Were we finished with that? He says, yeah, yeah. But I will not make full end of thee, but correct thee in measure. Yet will I not leave thee wholly unpunished. So he's going to still correct us, but he's providing a way out. He's giving us a chance to make it right with him. And that's the whole point. We have a chance now to make it right with him. Let that go and go to 2 Maccabees chapter 6, verse 12 through 16. 2 Maccabees chapter 6, verse 12. Mm -hmm. Second Maccabees chapter 6, verse 12. Now I beseech those that read this book that they may that they be not discouraged for these calamities, but that they judge those punishments not to be for destruction, but for a chastening of our nation. So once again, all the correction and all the slavery and all the police the hell, brutality, police, br br police brutality, everything we've suffered, extended prison sentences, exactly. The the man was it the max the mandatory minimum. Yep. Oh, listen, the, the prison systems, everything we go through in America today and what we've gone through was for our punishment. It was a chastising. We have to understand that we're in these predicaments because we fell away from the Heavenly Father. That's what we have to come to conclusion and understand. Read on. For it is a token of his great goodness when wicked doers are not suffered any long time but forthwith, forthwith punished. Mm -hmm. For not as with other nations... Whom the, whom the Lord patiently forbear to punish till they become to the fullness of their sins, so dealeth he with us. Let's read verse 13 again. For it is a token of his great goodness when wicked doers are not suffered for any long time, but forthwith punished. Mm -hmm. Read on. For not as with other nations whom the Lord patiently forbear to punish till they become to the fullness of their sins, so he did it with us. So what he's saying is, with the nations, he lets them ride out to the end and then just totally annihilates them. Until, they, until he's uh, sick of the nations. Exactly. What or, does. Because they are, until their sins reach the height of heaven and there's a stench to him. And then he wipes them out. With us, he stings us immediately. Right. He doesn't let us get away with half the things he lets the rest of the world get away with. And he's showing you that that's love. The fact that he stings you quickly... Let you know he gives a crap about you. You ever notice in your life that in your life you can't get away with X, Y, Z, but everybody else can. That means he loves you. 
because your stings and your corrections come quicker than everybody else. He says the way he deals with the nations, he lets them run their course, and he does away with them because they don't mean anything to him. Because if you love your child, you'll correct them quickly. You'll correct them before the magnitude of their sin gets too detrimental to where they can't come back from it. Right. And that's how he does us. So he's showing you. That's why we're in this predicament. Because he's stinging us quickly. He stings us quickly so we can figure it out. Read on. Lest that, being come to the height of sin, afterward he should take vengeance of us. Exactly. Because the longer he lets these sins pile up, he's going to turn his back on us and smash us. So we don't want that. So we we're fortunate that he stings us early and often. Read on. And therefore he never withdraweth his mercy from us. And though he punish us with adversity, yet doth he, doth he never forsake his people. So he's giving us adverse situations, adverse times. But the goal is, through this adversity, are we going to cleave to him? Because that's what faith is. The beginning of faith is the cleaving of yourself to the Most High. We're not cleaving to him. When we're facing adversity, we go further out in the world to solve the problems. He's trying to get us to get closer to him. So he can pull off this adversity. We got to figure it out and piece it together. Read on. I think it's, that's it. That's, that's it. Right? it. I think that's all you We're going to let that go. We're going to go to 2nd Ezra chapter 7, verse 1 through 11. 2nd Ezra chapter 7, verse 1. Read on. Read on. Yes, that's it. And when I had made an end of speaking these words. Now, don't forget, this is the same Ezra that just asked us, how long is this hell or this adversity is going to last for? Read on. And when I had made an end of speaking these words, there was sent unto me the angel, which had been sent unto me the nights before. And he said unto me, up, Ezra, and hear the words that I am come to tell thee. And I said, speak on, my God. Then said he unto me, the sea is set in a wide place that it might be deep and great. But put the case, but put the case, the entrance were narrow and like a river. Well, then, who then could go into the sea to look upon it and to rule it? If, if he went not through the narrow, how could, he, how could he come into the broad? So what he's saying is I, we as individuals, as Israelites, have to go through the narrow path to get to the other side. The narrow path is that chosen life. That life of following these laws and commandments. The life of committing your life to the most high. Mm -hmm. If we want to get out of these adverse situations, are you willing and prepared to live a, a disciplined life? Strict. A, a strict, disciplined life that is conducive to pleasing the Heavenly Father? Everybody wants good to happen in their life. Everybody wants God's blessings. Everybody wants, wants the Lord to look after them. But what are you prepared to give to Him to earn that? Or do we want we or do we want God to accept us as we are? Well, that's the problem. That's why we're getting our butts kicked by the cops, and we in jail systems, and we're, and we're sitting back here giving up 30, 40 years of our life in jail because we just don't want to give the Most High what He wants. Give Him what He wants, and we'll get out of our situation and circumstances. Read on. He says, verse six. There is a there is also another thing. A city is built and set upon a broad field. And it's full of all good things. This city that's built is the kingdom. And this is what we're all shooting for. And it's full of good things, opportunities, blessings. The struggle is over. Read on. The entrance thereof is narrow. Here goes that damn narrow entrance again. He's telling you, you ain't getting nothing without going through this narrow, damn Indiana Jones entrance. <laughs> on. And it's set in a dangerous place to fall. It's dangerous. You know why? Because he's showing you that if you don't make the right steps... If, you don't, if you're not conscious of the Heavenly Father as you're going through your life, you could fall. Read on. Like as if there were fire on the right hand and on the left a deep water. Imagine this narrow path that you got to cross to get to this beautiful kingdom over here, this beautiful city. And it's fire on one side and it's water on the other side. Fire and water are purging elements. Whether it's fire that's going to burn you or water is going to burn you or, or kill you or drown you. He's showing you that there's danger on all sides. This is our path. This is what we all as Israelites have to face. I got to stay on a narrow path if I want to get accepted. This is the cost of being that peculiar treasure. Right. This is the cost of being that chosen people. Everybody wants to point out, yeah, we're chosen, chosen, we're kings, we're princes, God, we're gods. They want to talk about that God's crap. But we, wanna, we don't want to live the strict life that's necessary to earn being chosen. It's one thing to be chosen, but are you going to earn it? 
And this is the problem with Israel. We don't want to live that tight, difficult path to get it. We want to rest on our laurels and accept the fact that this is what I am so I can be lazy. He said we had to walk this narrow path and dangers all around you. Read on. And one only path between them both, even between the fire and the water, so small that there could but one man go there at once. One person can make it at a time. So there's, you can't be piggybacking somebody else's spirit, somebody else's zeal. You got to study for you yourself. You have to study for yourself. Read the hell out the Bible and make changes for yourself. Read on. If this city now were given unto a man for an inheritance. That city is the kingdom and it is supposed to be your inheritance on the other side. Read on. If he never shall pass the danger set before it. If you don't fight the things in yourself and make the changes necessary. Read on. How shall he receive this inheritance? And that's the point. The inheritance comes to the people who actually follow the laws. So it's one thing to be chosen, but am I going to get my inheritance? I got to work for my inheritance. Even when you read in Revelations 10, when John asked the angel to give him the book, what did the angel say? He said, take, take the, book. the book, man. You had to take charge of your life, go in this Bible, and fix the things in you if you want something to work in your favor. If you want out of these jacked up conditions of life, what do you want to change in yourself to earn it? It's one thing to be chosen, but we keep being in this crappy condition because we're lazy and we don't want to earn the kingdom. We don't want to earn our blessings. We want everything to be handed to us on a silver platter because we're peculiar, because we're chosen, because we're special. No, we're low level if we don't make the changes necessary to please the Heavenly Father. Read on. Don't forget, Moses said, your father was a Hittite and your mother was an Amorite. He said, you came from nothing when I picked you up. So he chose to be great if we decide to live honorably. If we choose the path that he had set up for us. We were all chosen to walk this path, this narrow path with fire and water on the side of us. Read on. Verse 10. And I said, it is so, Lord. Then said he unto me, even so also is Israel's portion. This is what the angel told Esdras. This path is what every Israelite has to walk. If he wants to earn his kingdom. If he wants to earn his blessings. So knowing you're an Israelite is not enough. Knowing I'm Israelite, knowing that I'm peculiar, don't cut it. What changes am I willing to make to make to cross this path? What dangers and what obstacles am I willing to go through with myself to get what's mine? Don't forget in 6 and 59 of Ezra, he was like, listen, how long, how long is this situation going to be? How long are we going to be on the bottom? We're going to be on the bottom as long as we choose not to fight the things in ourselves. If we come back to the Most High and make these significant changes, it's how I get my portion. Read verse 11. Because for their sakes I made the world. Oh, listen, the world was made for Israelites' sakes. But damn, we still got to wake up and do our job and fulfill our destiny. Everybody, listen, this is why it's important that we're going over the fact that God chose us. But that's not it. There's more to it. Yep. We're chosen, but are we, are we living a chosen lifestyle? Are we earning the position that the Most High gave us? No, we're not. And this is why we're in crappy spots. So let's not focus. When we digest this entire class, the first half is for us to celebrate the fact that God did choose us. We are special. We were intended for greater things. But on the flip side, man, live up to your potential. Live up to what the Most High made you be then. Stop selling for low-level caliber in yourself. And if you do that, maybe you can fulfill your destiny and fulfill what you were chosen to be. Read on. Because for their sakes I made the world, and when Adam transgressed my statutes, then was decreed now that is... That now is done. So he says, when Adam, when Adam sinned, now the battle started. Yep. Now we were going to just wake up and everything was going to be okay. Right. Now we had to make change in ourselves and fight the things in ourselves and work on our spiritual deficiencies. It's not good enough that you just know who you are. Right. Once you know who you are, you got a Hebrew name, that's awesome. Now you're going to make changes and get closer to the Heavenly Father? Because the scripture says the Most High is a consuming fire. Right. So the closer I get to him, the harder it gets, the more uncomfortable it is. Right. And that's why it says, as you're going through this narrow path, you have fire and water on each side. And this is why also in James 1 and 22, 
the Most High says, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Come. He says, don't just hear this word, don't just read the Bible, but perform and, and, and imitate every action that you read in the Bible. God. So, from there, we're going to let this go and go to Isaiah 51, verse 1 through 5. And then we're going to go to 50, Isaiah 51, 1 through 5, and then 7 and 9. Isaiah mm -hmm. 51, 51, verse 1 through 5, and then 7 and or 7 and 9. Yes. 1 through 5, 7 and 9. Yes, sir. Isaiah chapter 51, 51 verse 1. Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock whence ye are hewn. So once again, if I'm here to seek the Lord, if I'm here to find out what it takes to get back on the Most High's good side, he said... Look unto the rock whence ye are hewn. Look into the power source where we were created from. Read on. And to the hole of the pit whence ye are digged. Once again, the, the key to us getting back to our prominence is for us to come back to our identity. Right. We have to dig up our history. Dig up our history. Dig up what our purpose is. And the, as I'm doing that, I should be detaching myself from the rest of this world. Read on. Look unto Abraham your father. And unto Sarah that bear you. Go back into your lineage. Go back into your roots. Go back into your history. Read on. For I have called him alone and blessed him and increased him. Exactly. Read on. For the Lord shall comfort Zion. So once again, he's reminding us that when you go back into your history, you're reminded that he's always been there with you. Yep. That's where the comfort comes. The comfort is, hey, man, you're chosen. All you got to do is follow what I'm telling you. Do what, I, do what you're told. Read these scriptures and commit yourself to this Bible and you will be comforted. He'll come through and take care of you. Read on. Verse uh, verse 3. Yeah. For the Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places and he will make her wilderness like Eden. So he says he's going to make your wilderness like Eden. He will comfort your waste places. Every scenario in your life that you keep running into difficulties with. If you submit yourself back to your power source, back to your history, back to who you are, he'll make these desolate places be prosperous again. And when you look at the Garden of Eden, everything grew on its own. Matter of fact, uh, it, it had not rained up until the time of, of uh, Noah. So the Most High was responsible and he was providing the providence of the people by making sure that he procured all of their food. They didn't have to till the ground to make the land prosperous. They didn't have to do work or go to work nine to five and punch a clock to make sure that they feed their family. Everything grew on its own by, it, by the Most High's providence. So the Most High said he'll return that type of lifestyle back to you where you don't have to work so damn hard just to survive. Now, and what he's saying also is that the blessings will come organically. Yep. They'll come naturally. So you can keep doing what you do normally and you'll get sustained. Versus having to spin your wheels and still not still be in the same place and not get anything accomplished. So he's saying when you come back to your power source, come back to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, where you came from. When you remember yourself, you remind yourself where you're, what you are and what your purpose is, then he'll make these desolate places fruitful. He'll comfort you in places where you weren't comforted anymore. He's promising he'll come through and fix your situation if you come back to who you are. Read on. And her desert like the garden of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Joy and, and gladness shall be found therein. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody. If you just tap into your power source. Tap into who you are as an Israelite. And not just tap into who you are as an Israelite. Make changes. Work on yourself, work on the thing, work on your pride, your selfishness, your doubt, your fear. Allow teachers to teach you. Whether you're in Virginia, you're in Albuquerque, you're in Houston, San Antonio, wherever. Get to a school and get taught and allow people to teach you the word of the most high. And help build you up in your pursuit. Hold that verse, go to Isaiah 40 and 2. We're going to go back to Isaiah though, 51. You want to, okay, so uh, Isaiah, Isaiah 40, 40 and 2 and then we're going to go back to yeah. Isaiah 51. Okay, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1 and 2. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, said your God. He said it's time to comfort you now. Read on. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. We have been sinning, but he says the warfare is over. Now it's time to come back. 
Now it's, come, now it's time to come back and change. And come back to your rightful position serving him. We've all got stunned. We've all got punished for our wickedness. Let's make it right now. The Most High is open and ready for us to come to him. Stop running. Go back to Isaiah 51 and give me verse 4 and 5. Isaiah chapter 51 verse 4 and 5. Hearken unto me, my people, and give ear unto me, O my nation. For a law shall proceed from me, and I will make my judgment to rest for a light of the people. Read on. My righteousness is near, my salvation is gone forth, and mine arms shall judge the people. The owl shall wait upon me, and on mine arms shall they trust. Give me verse 7. Verse 7. Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Fear ye not the reproach of men, neither be ye afraid of their revelings. So he's saying to hearken. Revilings. Revelings. Yeah, revilings. Yeah, revilings, revilings. He says, hearken unto me, ye know, know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Fear ye not the reproach of men. He's telling you, come to him and not worry about what people think about you. Come back to your identity and stop trying to please the world. And focus your energies on pleasing the Heavenly Father. Read verse um, 9. Verse 9. Awake, awake, put on strength. Stop. He says, awake, awake, put on strength. We're going to read what this strength is. It's Isaiah 33 and 6. Isaiah chapter 33, verse 6. He says, awake, awake, put on your strength. We're going to find out what that strength is. Read on. Isaiah chapter 33, verse 6. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy time. Wisdom and knowledge is the stability of your times. Read on. And strength of salvation. So our strength is coming back to the wisdom and knowledge of who you are. The wisdom and knowledge of how to please the Heavenly Father the right way. This is what it's going to take to turn the tides back into our favor. And the more of us that come together and make these changes, the most high will be able to get us out of this place. But it takes one individual at a time. And this is why we're commissioned to be fishers of men and women to get us back into the Bible to sit back here and come back to our identity. Okay? Now, read verse 9 from the top again. You want to... Uh, 51, 51 and 9. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I kind of jumped up. Isaiah chapter 51, verse 9. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. So put on the knowledge and wisdom of the Most High, or the wisdom and knowledge of the Most High. Put that on as your strength. Read on. Awake, as in the ancient days, in the generations of old. Are thou not it? That hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? So he's saying, listen, go back to your history. When we was in our power, we did great things. But our power is in the wisdom and knowledge of the Most High. That's how we get back to pleasing the Heavenly Father. Now, I want to go to yeah, Isaiah 53, verse 1 through 3. Isaiah 53, verse 1 through 3. Or 52 or 53? 52, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 1 through 3. Isaiah 52, verse 1 through 3. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments. Those beautiful garments is the wisdom and the knowledge. The garments are supposed to cover you. They're supposed to come mm -hmm. over you. The clothe you, the garments, the law, the scriptures clothe you. He's like, armor up and let these scriptures and this knowledge become you. Read on. O Jerusalem, the holy city, for henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. So he's like, when you come to this wisdom and knowledge, now we're supposed to not allow and tolerate this, uh, the uncircumcised and the unclean things, the unclean ways, the negative ways that got us in this debased state in the first place. Not only are you supposed to get the wisdom and knowledge, we're supposed to make changes in ourselves. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's what the uncircumcised and uncleanness is. Get the uncleanness out of yourself. Read on. Verse 2. Shake thyself from the dust. Shake ourselves from that low-level based mindset. Read on. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. So he's showing us as we get this knowledge, we get this wisdom, this is how we break these mental shackles off of us, mm -hmm. these spiritual restraints. This is what it's going to take for us to get out of our situation. We have to also awaken that spiritual side of us to get back to the Heavenly Father. This is how our life changes. Read on. Verse 3. For thus saith the Lord, ye have sold yourselves for naught, 
and you shall be redeemed without money. What he's saying is we've sold ourselves for now. We've given ourselves to the nations for nothing. We've got nothing in return for breaking the law and being wicked. Now we got to sit back here and get back right so we can we can please the Heavenly Father again. Okay? Let's do... um. Give me 8 through 12 in that same chapter, 52. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 8. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice. With the voice together shall they sing. For they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Break forth into joy. Sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath comforted his people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. And all, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. This is the future prophecy of the Most High coming back and delivering us. Read on. Depart ye, depart ye. Go ye out from thence. Touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. He's telling us if we want to get back to our power, we got to be clean. We have to come out of the ways of this world. Revelations 18 and 4. Give me that. Hold that. So... We have to be clean, we have to make changes, and we have to be sincere in us coming back to the Heavenly Father. It's not just coming back in knowledge and information, it's an execution, it's an application. He's telling us to come out of the world, to come out of our old filthy lifestyle. And let's read the Revelations 18 and 4 real quick as it goes right along with this verse. Revelations chapter 18 verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. That ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not her plague. What he's saying is, if we continue to follow the ways of this world, we're going to partake of these plagues. And these plagues are going to be significant. Thermonuclear destruction is coming to this place. And if we don't make these changes now, we're in for that. So this verse, and we go back to Isaiah 52, we tell us the same thing. Get clean. He says, touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her. Get out of this world. And get connected to the Heavenly Father. And then we'll get to be able to live our life the way we're supposed to live our life. In our power. Read on. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. Exactly. Because that's what he's expecting. Not just that I'm an Israelite. Hell, I'm an Israelite whether I know it or not. Right. But my vessel has to be clean. My spirit has to be clean. My mindset has to be clean. And that's what's going to take the work. That's where that path, that narrow path is about. Changing. Fixing the things in you. Fixing all the crap that this world has taught you. Read on. Verse 12. For you shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight. For the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your reward. Your re reward. Will be your rear reward. Yeah, your rear reward. So he's saying he's, he's behind you. He's looking there for you. He will support you, but you have to be proactive in your change. You have to be proactive in, in making the significant adjustments in your life if you want him to be there for you. He's showing you that you have to touch no unclean thing, go out of the midst of her, and then he says he will be there for you. He will go before you. But there's the, the condition of him going before you is you changing. That's the condition. We think God's going to carry us. He could be wicked as hell, have negative outlooks, and he's going to carry us. I can have all pride out of, out of this world, negative outlook, and he's going to be there for us. When we fight, he takes care of us. When we change, he's in. We're cleaning up ourselves. That's when he presents himself. Last verse we're going to go to for today is 2nd Ezra chapter 6, verse 7 through 9. 2nd Ezra chapter 6, verse 7 through 9. Then answered I and said, What shall be the, the parting asunder of the times? Or when shall be the end of the first and the beginning of it that follows? So this is Esther is asking this question. Okay, what's going to be, he said, what's going to be the parting of center of times? Or when shall the end of the first and the beginning of it follow? So when is the end of the world going to happen? And when is the, the new kingdom coming? How is it going to happen? When is it going to follow? What's going on? Because the reality is, in order for us to get our power, this place has to fall. Right. So as we're changing the things in us, as we're working on this, our spirit and working on our outlook and, and our conduct, the Most High is going to sit back here and remove and change his kingdom and give it back to us. He's going to remove the kingdom here now and give us our kingdom. So what he's asking is how is it going to go down? What's going to happen? Read on. Verse, verse 8. And he said unto me, From Abraham unto Isaac, when Jacob and Esau were born, 
of him, Jacob's hand held first the heel of Esau. So Jacob's hand, when he was a baby, held Esau's heel. The scripture says the elders shall serve the younger, right? So the first right. one that came out was Esau was going to have to serve Jacob. That was the prophecy. So he's explaining that before it goes into verse 9. Read on. For Esau is the end of the world. The so-called white man in power now, this last 400 plus years, has marked the end of of the world. He says, for Esau, the so-called white man, is the end of the world. Read on. And Jacob is the beginning of it that follows. The Israelites, are, it's our time next. To rule. To rule. To be in power for an everlasting kingdom. This is where the purpose of that everlasting covenant has coming in. Because the kingdom is coming to us. This is why the Most High is saying to come out of this Edomite world. Come out of this world's mindset. Come out of the American mindset. The quicker we do that, the quicker we'll have an opportunity to get to the kingdom, the real kingdom that's everlasting. So once again, we have to come out of the world's way of thinking, come back to the Most High, because Esau's time on earth is about to end. His power is about to go down. And when it does, it's our turn. This is a future prophecy, and it's coming sooner than we think. And with that, I would like to thank you for turning in to um, the Pursuit of Wisdom. Um, Duwada and Shalom. I'll see you next week. Shalom.